Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to those of you joining us from North America and good afternoon and evening to those of you joining us from around the world. I'm Squadron Leader Kieran Tinkler, currently a military professor at the Stockton Centre for International Law and a legal officer in the Royal Air Force. Before we begin, just need to make a few announcements. First of all, is just to clarify that the entirety of the three-day conference will be recorded and will be publicly made available to people uh, on YouTube after the event. The second thing is to encourage all of you to ask questions of each of our panels and speakers. So if you, you can access the Q&A box as part of the, as part of the webinar, uh, and we very much hope that you can um, ask questions as we go along and feed those through to the panels. Also, in that box, I will post the link to our website where you can access uh, the programme, agenda and flyer for this event. I'll now hand over to the Charles H. Stockton Professor of International Maritime Law and Chair of the Stockton Centre, Professor James Kraska. Thank you, Kieran. And thank you, everybody, for participating in this conference. It's my honour to be able to introduce the President of the Naval War College, Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield. She is a leader at the pinnacle of military education enterprise in the US Armed Forces. She's also an, a Navy pilot and operator and was a senior leader in, uh, in ComNav Marianas, Commander of Naval Forces Marianas, where she served as the commander of US Indo-PACOM's uh, leader for uh, all of the U.S. forces that are serving in, in Guam and throughout the Marianas Islands, uh, as well as that as a four deployed center for U.S. forces uh, in the Western Pacific. She is educated in international relations. She also studied at the Harvard School of Government and uh, earned a doctorate degree. She has served as a professor at the U.S. Air Force Academy. And so she's been a quintessential warrior scholar and the logical choice to lead the Naval War College. The Naval War College educates future leaders from some 60 different countries. And we also have a burgeoning research enterprise, which includes the world's preeminent war gaming uh, center outfit, uh, a number of other prominent research institutions that focus on cyber operations, Russia Maritime Operations, and the China Maritime Studies Institute. And the Stockton Center is within that research enterprise as well. And it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Rear Admiral Chatfield. Admiral? Thank you so much, Professor Kraska. Good morning to all. I would like to acknowledge uh, some of the many groups and people who are here today, uh, beginning with the La Yale Law School Paul Tsai uh, China Center, the US Army's National Security Law Division, the West Point Lieber Institute for Law and Land Warfare, and of course, my old alma mater for teaching, uh, the United States Air Force Academy. I'd also like to offer special thanks to Air Vice Marshal Tamara Jennings and the Royal Air Force Legal Branch for co-sponsoring the conference and for sending squadron leader Kiernan Tinkler as a professor of international law to our Stockton Center. Professor Kiernan is the director of this conference and has put together such a fantastic schedule of events and has done a terrific job within this Naval War College Center. And I'd also like to give a special thanks to Lieutenant General Charles Peaty, 40th Judge Advocate General of the United States Army and the support that his National Security Law Division has provided to this event. And lastly, I'd like to thank the chair and the entire team of the Stockton Center of International Law. Professor James Kraska and his team uh, have really done a lot for the advancement of uh, research and study in this area. So welcome, welcome to the Disruptive Technologies and International Law Conference. 
I'm so glad that you could join us virtually. Uh, you know, we love to host conferences in person, but this year, like everyone else, we have sought other means to bring together the minds and those interested in these particular topics. Uh, and so we can continue our work forward despite the challenges that we've all faced uh, throughout this COVID-19 crisis. Hopefully this conference will provide a bit of a respite, uh, a respite, sorry, uh, and a, a forum for people within this community of practice to have some opportunity to share ideas with each other and also to socialize across this platform to keep in touch and to advance your networking and relationships. This year, you'll be discussing how technologies are challenging our force structure and military operations across a range of emerging capabilities and those legal implications, such as how artificial intelligence affects the use of force, how sovereignty and neutrality will apply in cyberspace. What's the law of armed conflict going to look like in outer space? And what are the navigational rights and belligerent rights of autonomous surface ships and submarines? International law governs the use of these capabilities and is already affecting how we operate transforming our strategy, our policy, and our operations. More changes are certainly to come. And through dialogues, dialogues like this one, you can help to craft these policies and those rules. I'm here today to kick off this very important conference because of the dedicated work that the United States Naval War College has done to understand and answer these questions of international law. The more we prepare and understand each other, the more effective our forces will be when they operate. Our role here at the United States Naval War College is to inform today's decision makers and to educate tomorrow's leaders. In today's dynamic security environment, Numerical and technological superiority are no longer enough. Our chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has asserted that we will also need to continue to outthink our adversaries. At the Naval War College, we provide the environment to expand the intellectual capacity of naval, joint, interagency, and international leaders to achieve cognitive advantage. Our objective here in Newport and around the globe is to deliver excellence in education, research, and outreach, and build enduring relationships with our alumni and partners. The Naval War College is committed not only to conducting research, simulations, and academic courses in the field of international law when appropriate. We also want to be a leading voice within DOD and among international militaries, working to improve all of our abilities to better understand these legal issues. Some of the contributions you will hear during this conference will be published in volume 97 of International Law Studies, the Naval War College's Blue Book which is the oldest publication at the Naval War College and the oldest journal of international law in the United States. I'm confident that this week's program will engender a greater understanding of the confluence of technology and the law, providing practical advice to decision makers and shaping and influencing the scholarly debate. My team and I are glad to have this opportunity to further develop relationships throughout the international law community and to amplify conversations between operators and lawyers. My challenge to all of you today is to open up your minds and think outside of your own areas of specialty. Listen and think critically about these important topics. Provide feedback to one another to make our discussions as meaningful as possible as we drive toward the exploration of answering 
these legal questions. Thank you so much again for your attendance today, for being such a wonderful part of this productive and successful discussion and conference. And I'd like to turn the floor back over to Professor Kraska. Thank you again for attending. Thank you very much, Admiral, for that thoughtful introduction to the conference. It's now a pleasure for us to welcome our first keynote speaker, a real thought leader in the field of technology and military operations. It's Paul Share. He is a senior fellow and director of the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. He's the author of the book, Army of None, Autonomous Weapons and the Future of War, which won the 2019 Colby Award and was one of Bill Gates's top five books for 2018. Uh, Dr. Shari worked in the Office of the Secretary of Defense in the Bush and Obama administrations. He earned a PhD in War Studies from King, King's College London and is a former Army Ranger with multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. So Dr. Shari, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. I'm very excited all these folks could join us today for this discussion. And I'm really grateful that we are able to connect uh, and have these kinds of conversations, uh, even in the current environment. I'm going to try to keep my opening remarks pretty brief, so we have plenty of time for Q&A. I uh, just want to give really an overview of the technology in terms of autonomy and autonomy in weapons in particular, and then some of the legal debates to maybe frame um, some of the legal issues surrounding this technology. To start with, I think it's worth pointing out that um, the use of automated functionality in weapons dates back uh, at least to World War II, depending on uh, what types of autonomous functionality that you're looking at. But certainly in World War II, we see the origins of the very first precision guided weapons, uh, homing weapons, uh, anti-ship bombs and torpedoes that have sensors on them uh, simple sensors, but that are able to sense an enemy target and then maneuver to hit that target. Now, these are, of course, uh, weapons that, you know, you wouldn't really consider very intelligent by today's standards. They're not using machine learning. Uh, the term AI hadn't even been invented yet. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that they have some measure of autonomy. And we've seen this technology advance considerably uh, over the, you know, 70 years since then. And we've seen a tremendous amount of development um, in not just the sophistication of the role of autonomy in weapons, but also the proliferation globally and across different domains of warfare. So we now have widespread use of a variety of different types of functionality of autonomy in weapons, whether it's things like homing munitions uh, that have the ability to sense their target and then maneuver to hit that target, but the human is still choosing uh, the target or group of targets that's being attacked, or things like automated defensive systems, um, like modes on the Aegis combat system, that at least 30 nations have similar types of functionality that are used around the globe today. So that's a sort of a snapshot of, of where we are today in this moment. Uh, we see more and more countries incorporating autonomous functionality in weapons going forward. And I would compare the trend to much of what we're seeing in self-driving cars, where we see individual tasks being taken over by automation incrementally. So if you buy a top of the line automobile today, it's going to have features like intelligent cruise control, automatic braking, uh, self-parking. We're still a ways away from a fully autonomous car that would, you know, have no steering wheel, like the, the car that Google has built, and could be used, you know, in all road environments, all environmental conditions. Um, one of the things that's different, though, is that for cars, there's widespread agreement about what the goal is. That in the long run, you know, it would be ideal to be able to build such a car where the human is no longer involved in the actual physical driving tasks. Uh, humans are not particularly good drivers. Uh, there are, you know, 30,000 or more people killed on the roads in the United States alone every year, uh, many more killed globally. So if we could automate that task, 
Uh, and we could do so with a high degree of accuracy and we could build more effective cars. Uh, we could save potentially uh, tens of thousands of lives just in the United States alone. That's at least the goal. Now, people might debate on you know, where the technology is today and when we're going to get there and over what timeline with cars. What's different with weapons is there's a lot of debate about where we ought to even be going. Um, now, to simplify things a great deal, uh, you, can, you can put people into maybe three broad camps about what to do about this technology today. Uh, there are certainly arguments coming from humanitarian disarmament groups um, calling for a preemptive legally binding treaty that would ban autonomous, autonomous weapons. I'm gonna put that in quotes because not universally agreed upon what that term means. Uh, it's a topic of a lot of discussion. It's a topic of DOD policy um, and international debates, at least since 2014 at the United Nations. But there are no sort of universally agreed upon definitions. Uh, there are definitions in DOD policy, but those are not necessarily the same definitions that the UK uses. Uh, so even other allied governments, you know, don't, don't use the same terminology. There's another, you know, sort of argument or school of thought that says, look, we have a set of rules governing behavior um, and what's right and wrong in warfare. It's called the, the laws of war, laws of armed conflict. And we should trust those and allow those to regulate emerging technologies, whether it's autonomous weapons, artificial intelligence, other technologies, and uh, simply focus on adherence to these pre-existing rules. We don't need to be layering ad hoc regulations on specific technologies. And in fact, they could maybe warp or distort compliance with the, um, the laws of war. So that's another, another school of thought. Uh, and then there's a, a third, maybe sort of middle camp, if you will, that maybe we need some, some kind of regulation uh, on technologies. Now, I'll just point out, this, these sort of differing schools of thought are in some ways actually less about autonomous weapons and more about how people view the laws of war themselves or the law of war itself and its ability to adapt to new technology. And I suspect that for many of the people in these different camps that if you sort of said, look, I have mystery weapon X, I have a mystery weapon in this box, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Should we ban it right off the gate? Should we just let the law... Uh, of armed conflict play out and focus on adherence to it? Or should we maybe regulate it in some way that people's intuitions um, about the law of war and its ability to adapt to a new technology might inform where they're coming from independent of what that technology is. So um, specifically when it comes to autonomous weapons, what I'll say is that I think there's also two other, two other kind of dimensions to how we might think about this. One is um, what is possible based on the state of technology today? And I think that's really important. We want to be grounded in the technology, what it's doing, how it's evolving. Uh, so one way to approach this would be to say, you know, what is it capable of doing? Uh, what are the technology not capable of doing today? And then we might craft some kind of regulations that might govern state behavior. These could be codified into law or maybe, um, you know, sort of non-legally binding uh, principles or best practices. But that's one way to approach it. Now, there's value in, in certainly doing that and grounding these discussions in the state of technology. But there's another perspective that I think is also really valuable, which is to say, you know, if we had all the technology in the world, what tasks in warfare require uniquely human judgment, if any, and why? And that's a very different perspective. That's one that sort of says, instead of looking down at our feet and say, you know, how do we navigate around the obstacles right in front of us where we are today? But Let's look out at the horizon and say, where do we want to be going? And I think that's particularly important for technologies like autonomy and artificial intelligence because they are moving forward so rapidly. And there is just a great amount of uncertainty about where the technology is going. It's possible that it, it peters out and plateaus and we see another AI winter. That is one school, that's one argument that people make. There's people that believe that's where we're headed. In fact, uh, that the whole current State of affairs in machine learning is misguided. That's, a, that's an argument that we hear from some folks in the AI field. There's others on the opposite end of the spectrum that will argue that, you know, in a few decades, we'll see human uh, level intelligence. Um, I, my, my personal suspicion is probably both of those are maybe a little misguided, uh, but that's a wide range of possible technological futures. So I think there is value in asking the question, of if we had all the technology that we could imagine building, what role do we want humans to play in warfare and why? I think it's an important question to be asking and focusing our attention on. Um, we can 
we can get into this more in the Q&A, but actually the DOD Law of War Manual talks about this um, and talks about you know, the, this idea that the law of war imposes obligations on persons, not machines, to comply with uh, law of war rules on attacks like proportionality or precautions in attack. Uh, I think it's actually an interesting position to take that it's a human obligation to comply with the law of war. Um, and that has potentially implications for how we think about this technology and the role of humans. Uh, so let me go ahead and stop there. So we have lots of time for Q&A and happy to take the discussion where folks would like to go. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, so much for those great remarks. Um, and, you know, we'll certainly have some questions rolling in. Um, but at first, if I could, um, the, the first question is, you know, you've talked about some, um, maybe some misrepresentations of these, the machines, these systems, or, or maybe some confusion in their use. To you, what do you think is the biggest confusion or misunderstanding about the technology and their potential uses? I think one of the biggest problems here is that the terminology is very, conf it's not confusing, perhaps the wrong word. It's that it's, it's vague and open to interpretation. So if I just say, you know, autonomous weapon, that conjures a whole wide range of visions in people's minds. So some people are envisioning the Terminator. Other people are envisioning a Roomba with a gun on it. Something very simple. Uh, both of those are probably bad ideas, but for very different kinds of reasons. And I think that's a real challenge in the space when we talk about autonomy or artificial intelligence. Some people envision very advanced types of systems that have human-like intelligence, things that are coming out of science fiction. Other people are envisioning the kinds of things that exist today, um, which have a many, many limitations. Even the most advanced machine learning systems today, um, things like GPT-3, one of the most advanced um, um, you know, language generation systems, uh, can produce very realistic or realistic seeming text um, that can generate artificial text that's written by an AI that will easily hu fuel humans, at least uh, at a first glance, you might read it. And you might say, you know, I think maybe a human wrote this, but it lacks purpose and lacks intentionality. It certainly lacks any kind of understanding uh, at a deeper level of what the text means. Um, and so I think that that's just a real obstacle when we talk about this is um, sometimes it's just not clear what people are talking about when they use the terms. I've certainly been in, I've sat in discussions at the United Nations where diplomats are discussing this and people will be making these arguments and they're talking about different things. One person's making an argument using this terminology, talking about things today. And another person's using the argument, talking about terminology, you know, the, the things that may not exist in 30, 40 years, if ever. Um, and that's, a, I think, a real hindrance as we try to grapple with, you know, what should we do about this technology and some of the choices in front of us. And I, speaking of uh, terminology, I think Hope has a, has a good question, um, kind of to baseline us a bit here. She says, can you talk a little bit about human in the loop versus human on the loop communication with autonomous systems? Yeah, so a, a real foundational concept when we think about autonomy is um, a set of uh, terms about human in the loop, on the loop, or out of the loop uh, are the sort of terms that are used. That are used to refer to what you might call semi-autonomous systems, where a human is in the loop. That means that the system is um, performing a task, and then it will stop and pause its operation and wait for a human to take a positive action to do something. A very simple example of this that, that we're all familiar with might be like automated updates on your computer where it's popping up a window and it's asking you to click OK to uh, do the automated update to download something and restart your computer. Uh, there might be situations where that's valuable. For example, if you were in the middle of a webinar with hundreds of people, this would be like a bad time for my computer to decide to do that uh, if it was doing it on its own. So that's an example where there's a human in the loop and a human, you know, maybe doesn't have to do very much, but has to at least um, make some kind of positive action to authorize the system to continue. Uh, a, a different sort of paradigm for the human involvement in the machine would be a human on the loop system uh, where the human is in a role of supervisory autonomy, where the system is going to operate entirely on its own and the human has the capacity to intervene but it doesn't have to. Uh, a good example of this that we're all familiar with would be a thermostat in your household, right? So the thermostat doesn't ask you 
uh, permission to turn on the heat or the air conditioning, uh, that would be really burdensome. Um, instead, you set the desired temperature and the thermostat will function on its own. And then if you're not happy, you can get up and you can make modifications or adjustments. Um, and then a fully autonomous system where the human is out of the loop is one where at least for some time duration, the human is unable to intervene. Uh, that might be that you're out of your house and you can't intervene in your thermostat's functionality. And one of the interesting um, elements of how a technology is evolving is it's both building more intelligent systems that we might be willing to hand over more control to machines, but also building more connectivity to them, right? So if you, you buy a, a newfangled uh, thermostat these days, you can get one that's online and has a mobile app and you can you know, monitor it when you're out of your house if you were inclined to do so. Um, so, you know, that's also the case for weapon systems, right? We have increasingly smart weapon systems, but are also network enabled that enable more ability for human operators to actually be connected remotely and exercise remote control over the system than might have been the case um, in, in prior years or decades past. So those are, I think, some of the interesting trends for how we think about human control in ways that are enabling both smarter systems, but also in some ways, greater human control, uh, even remotely. So you bring up a great point and, and something that uh, John Chan asked, and he's our, he's our first question um, today. So we appreciate John for, for jumping into the void, being the very first question in the event. Um, before I ask that, I would encourage you, you can see on the question and answer function, you can see the little thumbs up. If you like a question, you can click the thumbs up and help bump that question to the top. We now have uh, 10 questions actually total because we have um, several others coming in. Um, from the chat. And so please do so. If you want to, if you see a question you like and you want it to be asked, uh, let, let us know because we probably won't be able to get to all of the questions that are asked in, in every section. With that said, um, Paul, John, you, you talk about human communication. John's fear um, is that there'll be uh, communication from outside and there'll be a situation where one of these autonomous systems could be hacked. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, and, and let me just add, these are great questions. So I think um, very helpful people are, you know, voting them. Um, this is a great question. And I think it, it cuts to one of the important differences with autonomous systems, which is not necessarily that it is more likely to be hacked. Um, you know, any anything that's got a computer chip in it, uh, that's got software is vulnerable to being manipulated and vulnerable to cyber attack, even systems that are offline. There are all sorts of, you know, clever ways to find ways to, to get in, uh, you know, using humans often as, as the weak link. However, one of the things that's really different is about the effects if you were able to get in to an autonomous system and in particularly about scale. And this is an important difference, right? It, the concern with something like an autonomous vehicle is not just that you could hack a car and then use it to carry out, you know, a terrorist attack and kill someone. We've seen, of course, unfortunately, automobiles used in sort of vehicle ramming terrorist attacks, uh, both in the U.S. and overseas that have killed people. Um, the real concern is that you could do so at scale that using the same cyber vulnerability, you could hack an entire fleet of cars that might have that vulnerability and take control of them. Um, you know, in it's already been demonstrated, certainly, that uh, cars today can be hacked you know, remotely and the driving features have been disabled. Um, that's several years old, that kind of technology. Um, what more autonomy enables is able to actually take control of them. Um, and then you could use them to, you know, conduct a mass vehicle ramming attack uh, or, you know, in perhaps a less deadly but still disruptive way, do things like disrupt traffic or cause, you know, protests. In the military context, the really frightening thing is losing control over not a vehicle, but a fleet of vehicles. Um, and it opens up the door to a sort of uniquely problematic form of enemy counterattacks, something like a mass fratricide attack where you can imagine not just sort of a, um, you know, we certainly struggled in Afghanistan with things like insider threats, where uh, a friendly turns on friendly forces and attacks them. You could imagine through the, you know, through cyber mechanisms, someone taking control of a fleet of autonomous systems and then turning them on friendlies. Uh, and that's sort of just a whole new, or even an accident causing that. Um, and we've certainly seen accidents with autonomous systems like the Patriot fratricides in 2003, uh, isolated cases, but one could imagine situations where that happens at scale because of flaws in the system and maybe how it interprets friendly forces. So there are, I think, a, you know, a whole range of novel problems 
that autonomy introduces that we certainly want to think about um, and be cautious about as we think about employing the technology. So, in regards to employment of the technology, Professor Ashley Deeks and Professor Laura Dickinson um, each ask a, a different but similar question, and it revolves around the arms race among the US, China, and Russia with these technologies. Um, and, you know, Ashley asked if you have thoughts on whether there's a way to slow this arms race. And then Laura asked the related question what's the status of the arms race among, you know, these, these three superpowers? Could you address that? Yeah, so first of all, I, I don't think there is a quote arms race underway. I think that's, um, that, that makes great sensational media headlines. Um, I don't think it's accurate. Um, if, we, if we think about an arms race, what does that term mean? Um, it uh, certainly in the security studies literature, it refers to a condition where states are spending uh, significantly above their normal rates of growth of military spending um, in a way to compete with each other. We have historical examples of arms races like the naval arms race uh, among great powers at the early 20th century uh, and certainly the nuclear arms race during the Cold War. Uh, neither of those uh, are good historical examples for what's happening today with artificial intelligence or autonomous weapons. In fact, when you look at the amount of money being spent on the technology, uh, it's quite small. Um, despite you know claims by DOD senior leaders that AI is their number one priority, Secretary Esper uh, had said that, uh, former Secretary Esper, that AI was his number one priority. Uh, when you look at the spending, it's, it's not. Uh, it's not even close. Um, so... And in autonomous weapons, you know, I think we can certainly see that countries are investing in more autonomy in their weapons. It's not obvious that there is a sort of full out pursuit of fully autonomous weapons. Um, you know, I think, I think it's more, more of the situation of this incremental advancement over time. Now, having said that, um, certainly we don't hear the same types of um, restraint coming out of countries like China and Russia that you hear out of countries like the United States or the UK or other uh, democratic nations that are gonna be more concerned with um, the rule of law and, and conformance with you know, ethics and, and humanitarian um, behavior on the battlefield. And that is certainly concerning. Um, I, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that uh, you know, we are definitely headed towards a world of you know, fully autonomous weapons and the gloves come off. I think it's worth exploring whether there's opportunity for any kind of mutual restraint um, in this area and agreement among great powers. I think the, the current UN process is deeply flawed. I think it's valuable to do. I'm glad the US participated, but I think it's, it's frank. It's deeply flawed because the conversation is distorted by uh, humanitarian groups that are sort of pushing for a ban. And then you get, you know, sort of countries like the US and Russia pushing back against it. I think it's like the wrong conversation to be having. I would much rather having be conversations among the US, China and Russia about, look, is there any agreement that we can make among us about limits that we would want to establish on the technology? That's not going to be for legal and ethical reasons. Those countries don't see those things in the same way. They're not having these debates that we're having here. Um, but they do care about control over their own weapons. Uh, they do care about, you know, not having their systems malfunction on the battlefield. They might have different thresholds uh, for concerns about things like fratricide than here in the U.S. But I think that's the worthy conversation for us to have uh, with other great powers about whether there might be any, you know, sort of mutual agree upon rules about how we might use the technology going forward. Yeah, and I think the one thing that in discussions that the, the three states have agreed upon, there has to be some level of accountability. Um, but where that ac accountability lies and to what level is, is a great debate amongst the states and obviously civil society and, 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 and academia. Um, you know, both Linda and General Dunlap ask questions kind of revolving around that. And, you know, if if the, the manufacturer of the Roomba, um, you know, puts a Roomba in motion and that Roomba destroys your house while you're out, you know, shopping, um, you can turn back to that manufacturer for some kind of accountability. And Linda asks, you know, where that obligation lies in the armed conflict um, realm. And then General Dunlap further asks, what level of expertise do our commanders and operators need in relationship to that accountability? Could you address that? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think the I think these are good questions that we don't have clear answers to, um, and I think these are the kinds of questions that, in fact, 
um, the U.S. military itself will be grappling with in the decades ahead as we're fueling more sophisticated um, automated systems, ones that incorporate machine learning, um, and we'll have to be grappling with these things. I will make a couple general points for how we should think about this. Um, one is that the DOD's Law of War Manual um, takes the position that the, it's a human obligation to comply with the laws of war, that um, the law of war doesn't put obligations on machines that are inanimate objects, um, rules like uh, proportionality, precautions and attack applied to persons. Um, that implies some degree, I, my position, or I would argue that the extension of that is that implies some degree of human engagement with the use of force then. Not that humans need to be, you know, maneuvering uh, the missile down to the target. Um, that hasn't been the case, you know, since, you know, the invention of the catapult. Um, but rather that the humans need to have some awareness over the attack, the context, the weapon system itself, um, to understand what's happening on the battlefield or what's likely to happen uh, so the human can make an informed decision about uh, whether this is in fact a lawful attack. That we don't want a situation where after the fact, we're asking the commander, you know, why did you choose to launch this weapon? And the commander says, well, you know, I don't know. The machine said it was fine, so I just pushed the button. I'm just here to push the button. You know, I don't have any responsibility. That's not consistent with certainly um, mili you know, US military professional ethics and how we think about uh, the role of military professionals in uh, the conduct of armed, armed force. And so that's the kind of thing where um, it actually gets, I think, some really interesting questions about military professional ethics and what we think sort of the role of the military commander is. I think there's an important asymmetry here between um, those developing the code is one of the questions to get to and uh, the military commander on the field who's employing the weapon. And that asymmetry exists in a couple of ways. One is that... Um, you know, there's a uniqueness to the military profession as a profession that's about the exercise of the use of force. Um, and there's certain responsibilities that come with that, that the civilian programmer doesn't have. Um, but also, you know, there's some value in being able to, you know, actually look at particular situations and apply human judgment to those situations. How specific you need to get, I think is an open question. Um, but if you look at something just like the Aegis combat system today, it's highly customized. Um, by the commanders in the field based on the particular operating conditions that they're in. It's certainly not, you know, pre-established um, and then locked in place um, ahead of time. And I think that's probably the right paradigm that we're going to want for these systems, that we're going to want systems that aren't, you know, um, um, fully baked in, where all of the parameters are set by the designer. We're actually going to want things that are understandable to operators, but then operators can customize uh, based on the particular situations that they're in, because ultimately it's those operators' responsibility uh, what's happening on the battlefield. And, and thank you for that answer. You know, of course, it's a very difficult question. And, and like you said earlier, there's real, there's real no good answer. And, and all the questions that are being asked today are certainly not softballs for you. Know, these are they're being asked for for a reason, right? Um, hey, I'd also encourage you. We have now 16 questions, so please continue to hit the upvote if you want to see these questions asked. Um, we'll try to get to them as many as possible. We have a little less than 10 minutes left in this session, um, and and so you can see that the question from um, Tom Choinsky to hear your thoughts on you know the social, cultural, or international asymmetries that influence the discussion on autonomous weapon systems. So we've talked about Russia, China, the US, but you know, how do you, what do you see um, in the influence with regards to maybe civil society, academia, or the states? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most, um, it's a great question and it is, I think a really important one when we think about how the technology is going to be adopted going forward. Because we certainly know um, that culture and, and societal preferences make a big difference in how militaries adopt technology as it proliferates uh, globally. Um, I think, you know, there's some easy, I'll tell you some easy answers that I think are wrong, okay? Um, an easy answer that I often hear is, you know, these other countries, China, Russia, they don't share our values, they don't share our ethics, and they're just gonna fully automate things. And so ethics, schmethics, we need to throw this stuff out the window and we need to do so as well. Um, I think it's wrong for two reasons. One, I think it's, it's accurate that they don't share the same uh, concern about 
uh, human rights and compliance with the laws of war. Uh, I just don't, when I talk to say Chinese scholars, I don't hear the same emphasis on legal concerns about LOAC compliance that I hear from US scholars, but they do care about control over their military forces. So there are other concerns beyond legal and ethical ones um, that are also relevant here, just about you know, retaining effective control of your military forces on the battlefield um, and political control that they also are going to be concerned about that um, come to the forefront that are actually less dominant in the discussions here in the UN because I think legal and ethical issues sort of take, take the four of these conversations here uh, in the US context, uh, but these other things are, are, are important. I also, you know, it's not obvious to me that we should sort of like disregard our own ethical positions or view them as a constraint. I often hear people talk about ethics and values as something that's handcuffing us in the U.S. context. I don't think that's just the right way to think about it. I think a better way to think about it is that um, we want to act in compliance with our own values that informs how we approach uh, the technology or, or actions on the battlefield. Um, and it's not a, not, shouldn't be viewed as sort of a limitation or a constraint. Um, but rather sort of the frame by which we approach our own actions. Um, another thing that I often hear is that authoritarian regimes will be willing to automate because they don't trust their people. Um, you know, there's some element of truth to this. There's certainly a much more decentralized um, authority given to U.S. subordinates um, in the U.S. system compared to, say, in China or Russia. Um, it's not obvious that I think that the corollary to that is that they're going to then trust autonomy is not clear. And I certainly don't hear that necessarily, at least when I talk to Chinese scholars, um, that they say, oh, you know, we're going to trust autonomous systems. I, in fact, hear a lot of the same skepticism about trusting these systems that I hear out of um, U.S. defense analysts and U.S. legal experts. So um, I think it's a good question. I think we're not, it's not clear, really how uh, the technology will unfold in different uh, military cultures. But I think it's important. I think we really want to stay on top of that and look at how others are using it. I think you can see some differences now. Uh, certainly Russia is being much more willing to arm ground robots than the U.S. Army is um, and deploy them, including into contested areas like Syria. Um, that's certainly one important difference. When I look at Chinese you know, writings on um, AI, there seems to be a greater emphasis on command and control, which is, I think, an interesting uh, finding. But I think, um, you know, we'll have to see as the technology evolves how military culture informs how different countries adopt the technology. We have about three minutes left, and I'd like to get to two questions, if possible. Okay. The first one I'll try is, to keep it really, really short. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. From Professor Lubell, and, and Paul, you talked a lot about the, some of the confusion, misunderstanding of terms and of the technologies, and of course, that first one, is it one of the problems that the fact that we keep talking about autonomy rather than AI? Can you address the autonomy AI debate? Right, okay. So, um, uh, these terms mean different things. Um, both of the terms themselves are a little bit contested. So even in the technical field, there are multiple different definitions. Um, but in general, when we talk about AI, we're talking about the intelligence of a system, a machine, and its capacity to come up with the uh, right course of action in a given situation. Um, the right sort of moves to make, the right answer um, in order to accomplish a particular goal. When we talk about autonomy, we're talking about the freedom of a system to uh, perform that task. Uh, so maybe to make an analogy with humans that maybe might make the difference, let's think about Garrett Kasparov uh, playing chess, you know, defeated against uh, by, by Deep Blue, um, the AI system. So Kasparov, very intelligent at chess. We could also imagine situations where Kasparov is sitting on the sidelines watching a chess match. Um, he's still maybe the smartest player in the room, know the right moves to make, but isn't permitted to sit at the table and make moves, doesn't have the freedom or autonomy to do so uh, because we've told him, you know, you're not, you're not playing today. Um, and so those are you know, sort of different dimensions of machines. We could envision very intelligent machines that don't have much autonomy and they're used as decision aids for humans. Uh, and that could be one application for certain types of AI. So thank you for that really brief uh, response. It was very efficient, well done. Um, Michelle asked a question, um, a very specific question about asymmetric warfare. And we hear the, the argument a lot against these types of technologies, you know, the fear of the killer robot, the Terminator, 
Um, but specifically to Michelle's question, what do you expect asymmetric warfare against a largely robotic force to be? Um, I think that's an interesting question. Let me just say that uh, to, to, in my disclosure, I don't like the term asymmetric warfare uh, just because like, it seems like a silly term to me. Why would you fight symmetrically? You're always going to try to find ways to find your enemy's weaknesses and attack them there. Um, so I'm actually not a fan of the, the pattern in the U.S. Um, defense discourse of coming up with these labels of irregular warfare and hybrid warfare and asymmetric. I just think it's actually all war and maybe our concept of war is uh, overly narrow uh, in the first place and we need to broaden it. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting about robotic systems, like any technology, is they have countermeasures, they have limitations, just like when you move from, you know, horses to tanks, you now are dependent upon uh, fuel depots and uh, gasoline, you know, to, to fuel your tanks. Um, and that might be a way to, to go after them and undermine that technology. Robotic systems are going to have their own. Um, they could be communication links if they rely on communication links. Um, if they don't, then there might be other ways of hacking them uh, to manipulate them. If they're using you know, AI-based or machine learning-based models of perception. There are all sorts of ways to, to fool those kinds of systems and manipulate them. Um, we don't really have time to kind of get into that, but the, you know, the sort of whole world of machine learning-based perception, you know, identifying objects, automatic target recognition, has a whole suite of countermeasures to then spoof those um, AI-based perception methods and trick and manipulate them, as well as ways to even get in earlier in the learning process to things like you know, poison the data. So I think like any technology, there's going to be countermeasures and it's going to shift warfare in a new direction over time as we see more competition surrounding robotic systems autonomy and then ways to defeat those. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paul, for, for the questions and, and answers. And, and as you can see, there are 16 questions left that we were not able to get to, which indicates uh, how interesting your presentation was. And It's a fun topic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, and I would tell the audience, please don't, you know, save your questions because we're going to be talking about all these issues that Paul just addressed specifically throughout the rest of the day. So you can, you know, ask these questions again to our other panelists and, and they can answer them from very specific, you know, legal or otherwise points. But um, we're, we're about to go into our 10 minute break here, but I want to thank Paul so much for joining us today. It was a fantastic presentation uh, and we look forward to reading, reading here more from you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Take care. Okay, uh, we're going to go on actually an eight-minute break. We'll start back up at noon, um, and so uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much again for all those questions. Well, welcome back, everyone. It is my very great pleasure to now um, introduce our next speaker. Michael Tracy is a physics graduate from Columbia University. He is a co-founder of Anabasis Technologies, where he leads the image processing development um, aspect there. Uh, and Michael, I'm really, really excited to hear what you've got to say and for sharing um, what work you've been doing recently. So I'll hand over to you now. Um, yeah, thanks. Oh, thanks, Kieran. Really appreciate the, the kind remarks today. Good morning to you, everyone. I'm really excited to uh, share with you today to talk about um, SIP identification and artificial intelligence. Basically, how can we use artificial intelligence and um, satellite imagery to find and track any SIP in the world? Yeah. Yeah, so um, as you can see here, so just in the past few months, we've had quite a few is, uh, cases where the issue of SIP tracking has come up. Just last week, um, we had Roger Stone wear, true or not, claiming unidentified North Korean vessels off our coast of Maine, influencing our elections. We had piracy attack off the coast of England. Um, we have a... Uh, uh, ships from uh, Chinese uh, fishing, um, fishing fleets going to the Galapagos um, and uh, illegally uh, fishing there. And we have obviously uh, Venezuela and Iran uh, chronically always um, going under the radar and people not knowing where their oil tankers are. So why do we still have so many problems in uh, tracking ships in 2020? I mean, look at all the options we have. We have helicopter patrols, we got satellite imagery, we got radar, we got signals intelligence, AIS. How can these big uh, floating tubs of metal He'll disappear, uh, disappear nowadays. Um, when I'm in C CVS, I can figure out what's the annoying jingle they're playing at CVS pharmacy uh, with Shazam reliably, but we still can't uh, necessarily always say where a ship is nowadays. Um, so when we look at these ship tracking options that exist now, we can categorize them in um, 
how they collect uh, information like you see here on the slide. Uh, there's manual ship tracking where uh, we use helicopter and ship patrols to monitor ship activity. Um, and then we have also imagery analysts who will hand count the number of ships and satellite imagery photos um, you know, to figure out how many, uh, how big a fleet might be or how many ships are at the port right now. And the, both, of, both of these provide very high accurate information. Uh, their information quality is great, but um, they're not real time enough. And it's a very tedious and long process for both of these. These don't scale uh, well to have a global maritime picture that you want for your naval operations. Um, then we have our automatic techniques, right? Um, but they don't exactly provide the same high data quality like direct observation does with uh, helicopter patrols and satellite imagery. You know, radar is limited to the type of boats it can detect, um, and it's not really global either. Uh, signals intelligence, um, this is off of the uh, electronic equipment that's off of uh, boats. Uh, some boats just don't have electronic equipment, like some fishing boats. Um, and, this can, and these radio signals or electronic signals can be encrypted and spoofed as well. And um, then there's a premier technique that's uh, usually been adopted as a standard after the um, being accepted by the international community, which is AIS, Automatic Identification System. But before um, we talk about these problems, we should try to understand what is AIS. So like I said, AIS stands for Automatic Identification System. And basically what AIS is, is GPS, but for boats. So a transponder, a little black box on the ship, signals out its location with the ship's identity for everyone with access to an AIS data feed uh, to see. So like you see here in the, the bottom right, here's a popular AIS provider, Marine Traffic, where um, you can see all the boats in the world that are giving off its locations. But that's the key. Um, it's the ones that are giving up its locations. It, 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 some boats are able to turn this off. So what do I mean by this? Um, AIS has three chief concerns, right? There's limited detection, there's unreliable detection, and voluntary detection. So when I talk about limited detection, as you can see in the map here, um, it can get definitely very crowded in certain areas, especially around when you're near the Singapore Straits or the Straits of Dover. All these signals coming from there, they can um, cause interference, which can uh, lose to some of uh, uh, the location signal, lose the location signals of nearby ships. And then we have unreliable detection, um, right? Um, we have unreliable detection where uh, these uh, signals, they can be easily spoofed or hacked. So like, for example, you see here, um, this, is a, this was an example, this is an, um, but where some hackers are able to manipulate an AI signal coming from a ship and uh, choose a very non-natural um, manipulated vessel route that spelled out uh, the hacker term called PON, which basically means you've done goofed. Um, so uh, as you can see, it can be very insecure. And this is um, definitely uh, very scary in so far that the maritime industry in general or shipping uh, electronics can be pretty insecure. Um, the maritime cyber attacks have increased by over 900% in the last three years. So this is definitely something to be very concerned about that where we know our boats are can um, just be changed, manipulated by either someone on the boat itself to show it somewhere else. There's been cases where people have been very flagrant and they show the ship's location um, in uh, the, the middle of the Sahara Desert where there's obviously no water or the middle of Antarctica where it's just ice. Um, so yeah, this, this is a very uh, important problem. And then we have the worst problem though, voluntary detection, right? AIS requires ships to voluntarily disclose their position for everyone else to see. That means um, a ship can just stop showing, uh, showing her location at a switch of a, at the flip of a switch, right, on or off. And this makes it very imp near impossible to track vessels engaged in illegal activity, right, like piracy, illegal fishing, uh, Iranian tankers evading uh, uh, sanctions, uh, because they'll have their AIS off. Um, this also makes it extremely difficult to know where uh, boats are uh, when they're navigating dangerous waters, like the Gulf of Aden, because they have their AIS hidden uh, hidden from pirates. Um, so it's very obvious that AIS is not likely uh, tracking ships when they're violating international law and uh, committing crimes. Um, so what, what does this mean? Only the manual methods are able to provide the data quality we need to know where um, the ships are. But how do we get around the time constraints of collecting data from satellite images? We need to automate this process somehow. If there's one thing AI is extraordinarily good at, despite all the, the clamor for it the past decade, is uh, doing highly repetitive tasks, like counting the number of ships and the satellite image. That's why we do facial recognition for ships. Just like how facial recognition algorithms are able to identify and track um, people in highly complex crowds and environments, we can do the same for ships in highly complex satellite images, like we did here on the, the right image here. Um, and then with, with facial recognition, um, like they do, we're able to build a database for these ships. So for example, uh, like a normal driver's license database, you have a person's uh, face, you have a photo of them, then you have where they reside, and then you have some physical characteristics describing where they are. 
with um, our algorithm, we're able to actually capture a photo of ships where they are in real time. And then we can update where their current location is without having to rely on them reporting it. And um, like you see here with the location, the latitude and longitude of the Merlin Young M. And then we can also um, actually estimate uh, certain physical characteristics for it. For example, like the length and width, we're able to do this by uh, the different pixels they are. Um, like you can see here, I have it detected. That's what we estimated. And then the actual length and width is reported on the AIS. So we're actually able to make comparison. But this is just an example of like a scorecard or a driver's license we will have for a ship that we're developing. So what allows us to build a database for uh, ships now? Why is this only now possible, right? Um, so there's two major reasons, two uh, major trends that allows this to be possible, right? So number one is for uh, high frequency satellite imagery. As you can see in the chart on the bottom left-hand corner, um, the, the payload uh, to launching up uh, rockets to um, uh, space has just uh, dramatically decreased. That's a logarithmic graph there too, and you can still get a linear trend uh, on there nearly linear trend. So as you can tell, it's like exponentially dropping there. Um, so lots of satellites are now going up. So we're really able to do global coverage, especially over the oceans where it's just not realistic to uh, have big uh, man, uh, Coast Guard patrols going out there in the ocean. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Uh, with a high, uh, high amount of satellites in the sky, this becomes a thing of the past. And then two is just that um, the actual algorithms have become really good um, and, the, and actually counting uh, stuff, like I was saying earlier. Just five years ago, like you can see in this new art article, um, Microsoft and Google um, announced that uh, their AI algorithms are able to beat humans at image recognition. So it's a given now that uh, humans are, 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 machines are very good at recognizing uh, stuff. And also this is just partly because of just how cheap the processing power has become that is uh, effective to do in real time now too. Um, so um, the overall process of building this actual database and this insights is seen here, and I'm gonna walk you through them. You know, um, uh, we'll go through the ingest imagery, then we'll go to the text shifts, then how we identify and track them and how we can use this to generate insights to help us solve and uh, enforce inter maritime international law. So here um, on the ingest imagery slide, AI algorithms live or perish by data. That's how they grow, that's how they uh, become effective. If you have bad data, you're gonna have a bad algorithm. It's that simple. So it's uh, very critical from the essential studies that you have good data. What's the data we're using here to um, identify and track uh, these SIFs? So we're using open source data um, with optical satellite imagery, and then we're using uh, synthetic aperture radar imagery as our uh, main uh, imagery sources. Then we use other ones to try to uh, narrow down what uh, physical unique characteristics to these SIFs. So, um, the satellite imagery is, uh, is fairly well common. That's what you see on optical. That's what you see on your Google Earth. Um, but like one of the problems here, like you can see here, and this, this is a photo of Singapore, is uh, clouds. Clouds can block and uh, they can block any ships that might be underneath there. Like you see here, um, there could be ships underneath that that we just wouldn't see, even if we were able to uh, pre-process it away. Um, while SAR is able to see through clouds. So that's really helpful in actually seeing uh, boats that might be underneath the clouds. You don't have to necessarily be as concerned if you have light or, um, you know, daytime conditions, or uh, if there's clouds, you don't necessarily have to do that. The downside is that it's not as frequent um, uh, SAR imagery exists right now like there does with optical. So after selecting our data and putting it together uh, as a data set, um, we, the next step we have to do is basically um, uh, get our algorithm to train uh, to detect the ships. So the type of algorithm that uh, we're using, this is based off, is called a neural net algorithm, right? And neural nets are based off of the idea like um, how you teach a child is how, um, based on information you expose them to and help them uh, learn through labels, right? Like if you were to uh, teach your five-year-old kid um, some stuff, you would give him some books, but how, what you teach him and how you uh, make him grow up probably de uh, depends on what type of books you expose him to, right? And this is, is the same with data. How we expose, the types of data we expose them to and how we break it down to them is gonna influence how well they're able to pick up certain things, right? So like that big uh, satellite image you saw here, we're not just feeding that to them straightforward. It's like you were to uh, give a little child trying to teach them to read, you give them the dictionary. That's just not gonna work. You gotta give them chunk sized pieces, right? So um, what we do there is that we divide the, that image there that we see there into little tiny squares, pixels by uh, 45 pixels by 45 pixels. And then um, we geolocate these image squares, right? We, uh, we take the location where these squares are. And then, um, so we can figure out when we detect the stuff that's in there, that, like the ships, we know where it is. That's how we're able to have the location of these uh, ships without needing them to report it. And then, uh, we train it to detect ships, land, water, and cloud. So for example, these are like the four types of um, labels we're basically working with here. So, you know, if, a, um, if our algorithm saw an image like this, a square like this, it still recognized this is a cloud, this is not a ship. If it uh, saw this, 
Um, this is water. This is not a ship. Okay. Then there's land. This is land. And then when you get here, uh, I'll recognize, oh, there's ships. And then it should be, and then it will be able to count how many ships there are in this photo too, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, um, seven ships here. And then from that, we can understand the actual vessel activity, like how, how many vessels there are and uh, where they are in general. Um, so once we have fingerprinted the ship, um, yeah, so after we detected the ship, right, we located from satellite imagery. We already uh, did what imagery analysts uh, did. We automated that part where they would try to look in satellite images and figure out, oh, how many boats there are in this uh, near the port of Tartarus in Syria right now, right? We've done that. That's great. Um, how can we get more useful information? Because it's one thing to just know, oh, this is a ship. Okay, that's great. Uh, what's the name of the ship? Where can it be going? How, uh, you know, how can we backtrack the location of it? So uh, how do we do this? We make available of ships you know, broadcasting their AIS data. So usually we'll have a ship that will detect a ship. And then usually we'll also find an AIS signal also being broadcasted from that position, right? So we cross-reference it with it. And then we basically fingerprint it. Then we know later on, whenever we see a ship and another satellite image, so like we saw a ship in Singapore, but then we saw it in uh, Shanghai uh, a week later. Well, no, this is probably the same ship, even if it's not broadcasting its AIS signal. Um, and we know its name because we have a photo of it previously and we're able to match it with this one. It's kind of like a mugshot, right? Um, so that's how we fingerprint the ships. Um, yeah, so th at the end, uh, we were able to take a very complex image like this, right? Looking at this, you know, you can just imagine there's roads, there's airplanes, there's a bunch of clouds, uh, different uh, water uh, colors here. Um, it's a very complex image. This, uh, and, uh, you know, you got to zoom in and out to find all the different ships. We're able to uh, put this into our algorithm and then it can spit back uh, out to us uh, right away um, how many ships there are, right? So we're able to say there's on uh, May 5th of 2021 that uh, that uh, boat was, that a satellite image photo was taken. Uh, we can see how many ships there were. There were 230, uh, 223 ships off of our training data here, what we got. Um, and these blue and red dots, what does this stuff mean? So like I said, we basically locate, um, when we took that photo based off of the AI signal that was coming in within the five minute period of time. Um, and the blue dot shows that these are ships that had their AI signal being shown. Uh, being displayed, and then the red ones were they just weren't showing at the time. Either they were off, or they just weren't being broadcasted um, right right away. Because AI signals aren't always being broadcasted in instantaneously, repetitively. Yeah. So, uh, for example, here uh, for comparison, here here we have like a I believe like an oil tanker of some type. Um, actually, this is a cargo vessel. This is development. But like you can see, we have the latitude, the longitude, the name, and we have the time where it was at this exact location. Then we have here on the right looks like a small watercraft. Um, we're able to identify that partly small size like this was just 10 meter resolution, um, partly because we uh, look at the wakes of there, right? The, from the movement of the uh, boat, we're able to detect that. And we have the location for it, but we don't have the name for it. But we are at least able to identify, look, there was this small boat activity happening in this area, which can become obviously very useful if you're trying to um, monitor drug trafficking near your borders or wherever, because obviously those people are trying to be discreet and they might be using uh, small cigarette boats or something like that. So um, the big takeaway, oops. <laughs> um, so the big takeaway from that last section about facial recognition for SIPs is that because of the disruptive technology of AI, we have never before um, able, um, capability to actually uh, figure out where uh, certain fleets are, how, how, how they're coalescing in certain key regions like uh, around the South China Sea. We're able to um, figure out how popular certain ports are in real time. We don't have to rely on AIS data that's being generated from there because sometimes the ships, they just uh, kind of languish there and they never have their AIS on. I mean, we just saw that with uh, the Beirut explosion, right? There was that ship there that just kind of, no one uh, really talked about that was just there for seven years off. It wasn't obviously showing this AIS signal. And then next thing you know, you have an accident there. So um, that's another thing. And we can also get real time idea of the commodity movement that's going on there. Because uh, one thing that uh, we're also expanding this to is to do satellite imagery of the port areas themselves of how um, a certain material like iron ore is dumped in uh, Rotterdam to uh, measure that. And also just to figure out how many ships are moving in and out to get a real accurate granular look of the commodity movements in uh, areas like you see here in a, a Western Australian port. So um, like I was saying, uh, the big takeaway uh, in this last section about facial recognition uh, for ships is that because of the disruptive technology of AI, um, we can basically capture any ship in the world. And um, like DNA opened up a whole new possibility in criminal law about, um, uh, uh, you know, capturing criminals and enforcing them and breaking uh, open cold cases. Um, 
This opens up a whole new possibilities in maritime international law cases and enforcing maritime international law too. Not only are we able to see, uh, see where real and real time where ships are, but we can analyze satellite images of um, for events in years past. You know, this becomes really important, you know, if you want to analyze past oil spills and figure out who's really guilty of it. But um, before we get into that, like for example, in maritime boundaries, um, you know, there's no, it's very, uh, there's no actual the, the market, there's no uh, marine got line out there in the, the big ocean, the Pacific Ocean to know where or not uh, a ship is trespassing or not. This just doesn't exist. And it's usually pretty hard to uh, patrol the borders. Um, you know, there's obviously the South China Sea example, but one case where our algorithm is really helpful is actually in the Arctic Ocean. Why? Um, one, this is another very contested area, uh, contested area where uh, there's a battle for resources between uh, the likes of Russia, Canada, USA, Norway, et cetera, et cetera. But um, also what's really interesting is that um, GPS up there, there's a lot of navigation issues up there because of how uh, satellites orbit across the, the earth. Um, it's, it's, it can be pretty difficult to actually use GPS up there. So having an actual way to pinpoint um, uh, um, uh, the ships and the paneling of satellite imagery is immensely helpful. Um, and then South China Sea is just a great to see the, the field, fleet buildups and the EEGs is to really monitor who's violating whose EEGs actually in real time. You have actual data to support um, these claims now and not just eyewitness reports. Um, and then environmental, like I mentioned with China, IUU fishing, usually these uh, big trawlers and stuff, they, they'll just turn off their AIS and no one knows where they are. And they're going to other people's EEZ zones and, um, you know, just uh, uh, take fish illegally from there. And then, uh, and then uh, yeah, and then for oil spills, right? Um, just uh, the largest oil spill in Brazil, off the uh, coast of uh, Brazil, no one still actually knows who was the ship that did it because it had an AIS off. There's some suspicions of who it is, but nothing uh, verifiable yet. And then uh, for fuel emission regulations, like a, uh, has been put forth by the IMO this year to reduce uh, sulfate, uh, sulfur content from the fuel oil. We're able to actually monitor that individually from um, the satellites themselves. And then with piracy, um, just like before we have a uh, big fleet patrols and just like uh, kind of reports on how active the, uh, the waters are, but now we can actually forecast like how many uh, small Somali boats or Gulf of Guinea boats there are to get an idea like how risky actually the waters might be in the next 24 hours or so. And um, if you would like to talk more to me about this, uh, feel free to reach out to me um, at mst214 at columbia.edu and uh, my co-developer Mitchell as well at his email address. And I'll turn it over now um, to questions. Thanks, Michael. Uh, lots of exciting opportunities there um, as you've kind of gone through. So there's, there's a couple of good questions, I think, that have come in already. And um, the first one I'm going to go with is from John Chan, which is how would your algorithm deal with a bad actor changing the look of the ship to hide, you know, the nature of its sort of um, character, as it were? Um, sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. Can you repeat that? Yeah, so if if someone were looking to um, outfox your algorithm uh, and they were sort of, you know, to, and they changed the sort of the look of the uh, of the ship or vessel, how, yes, how, would, yes. how would it overcome that? Yeah, so if they did like a paint job or something like that. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's, I mean, partly of what we're doing is that we're also using uh, the geometry of the ships, which is, uh, as far as I've seen with a uh, ship uh, disguises, they're not really able to change. Uh, I've seen like, you know, changes of the hull, but we're not looking at the hull. So we have a uh, geometry characteristics, and that probably brings up the question, what about sister ships, right? Um, we're able to kind of like sort that out by uh, basically of the location and uh, predicting what vessel routes they will be, kind of like how a bank um, determines if there's fraud or not by basically on the location of where you're wiring your money in from or, or how uh, quick you hit the stock market, right? Um, there's just like certain, uh, these, uh, just, uh, there's just a certain, um, limit about where you can physically be with a boat. You know, it's pretty easy to uh, figure out, oh, the boat will probably be here in X amount of time. Um, this is like regression analysis stuff. Thanks. So, and um, then the next question, um, how, what is the possibility uh, of what you've talked about in terms of underwater vessels and kind of, and, and if there is scope for that, um, what, kind of, what kind of depths if you're able to get, to get into the details? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, the surprising thing is actually, we, uh, this hasn't been a, a primary area of research, but it is actually um, somewhat possible to detect underwater vessels if they're not uh, going too deep um, from underwater. Um, I'll give one example because this is uh, publicly known. Uh, some of it's from like the thermal characteristics uh, of the vessel, of, like uh, just from a, a, a massive heat engine there. Um, you can detect this uh, from satellite imagery. Um, there's other uh, physical characteristics that we've uh, found, but um, that's a proprietary too.
Great, okay, so, um, so ships that manipulate their AI's transmissions to master location, um, and then they're simulated to stateless vessels. Um, how would you use this technology to kind of, would you be able to have the sort of granularity of identifying, you know, what state this is, this vessel belongs to, or, you know, or is it just a case of, we know where it's come from, we think we know where it's going? So if I understand the question correctly, it sounds like you're saying, oh, what well, if they spoofed their AIS, uh, AIS location and then you're trying to cross-reference it with that? Is, is that what it is? I, I don't see the question. I guess, I guess the, core, the core of the question is um, you, you would be able to identify, you know, have a strong idea for kind of the, the nationality of the vessel um, as opposed to just where it's physically located in the world. So like uh, what flag is registered under or something like that? Yeah, something like that. Okay, yeah. So, um, no, we, uh, the thing about the shipping, right, is that it's uh, notorious for uh, flags being uh, uh, pretty uh, easily uh, switched around. Um, so we can't uh, necessarily directly say, oh, is, this is a, a Chinese vessel, right? Um, we can probably say that by following it and tracking it over time, right? Um, by seeing how frequently it visits certain ports. Um, but yeah, we can't necessarily just say off of the AIS signal, or well, that is shown by the AIS signal, but by the satellite image alone, we can't uh, necessarily say, oh, it belongs to this uh, country. Great, so another question is, is, is this technology, is, is this algorithm, is it either able to, or is it, is it, e is it easy to transfer it to, for example, looking to find people stranded at sea? Or is, or is it just the fact that, um, you know, you're, you're relying on satellite imagery for, for a completely different kind of data set? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Uh, we haven't exactly worked towards that, but um, with the current resolution we're working at, with 10 resolution, I guess we're working with others, but um, that would, uh, we think it would be possible. We haven't worked on that, but with like, when you get to like one meter three, or three meter, five meter resolution satellite imagery, uh, we believe that could be possible uh, to detect people at sea, or at least uh, uh, locate where a crash, uh, a sunken vessel was to narrow that uh, search area in the critical time that it takes to find a person like that. Thanks. So I'm going to ask uh, the question that Peter's posed in the Q&A, which is um, the maritime industry has resisted autonomy and maritime regulation um, for a uniform AI strategy. Uh, is that a problem for imp implementation of your approach? Yeah, great, uh, great observation. Um, that's the good part of our approach is that it doesn't rely on them. It's non-voluntary, relying on people uh, reporting their locations. So we don't rely on any sensors on these boats to give up their locations. We independently uh, detect them um, from the skies, from the satellites uh, themselves. Okay, and then the, the next one, if I may, is uh, Alvaro, who says, um, who asked the question, how can this be compared to, uh, how can this be compared, com sorry, compared the firmer ship obtained from satellite images from the same firm obtained from other sources? Does that, does that translate? Does that make sense? Um, no, I, I'm sorry. I don't exactly understand it. How does, um, how does it compare to other satellite image sources? Or I think, I think so. How, how does this system differentiate itself from perhaps other, other methods out there for just, okay. you know, analyzing yeah, yeah. satellite um, imagery? I, I, okay, I get what he's talking about then. Um, yeah, so uh, two key things. Um, ours is a really a data fusion uh, source. We're using a bunch of different uh, data sources. We're not just using optical satellite imagery. Um, we're also using SAR imagery and other uh, uh, satellite sensors to uh, track and detect ships to develop new fingerprinting uh, remarks. Um, the other thing is that we really, from the ground up, tried to build it um, a completely uh, a um, using AI and satellite imagery alone. Um, if you look at uh, companies like Airbus or something, the closest they have to this is they have like a help desk where you, if you wanted to find a lost vessel at sea, you would call them and then you would look through uh, the satellite images and apply them over a selective area. So under algorithm and some human uh, uh, looking at this. Ours is uh, from the ground up, really uh, an autonomous uh, AI approach to uh, doing this. So I'm gonna ask my own question. So in terms of uh, using satellite imagery, um, and you said it was all open source, like, have you sort of explored avenues for getting sources from, you know, because there's a proliferation of satellite companies uh, going up into space with electro-optical sensors, synthetic aperture radar. Um, uh, presumably, you're quite excited about the scope of additional data you'll get from that. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
Yeah, that's what we're actually currently exploring that, you know, with Planet and um, Maxar and those types of companies who are who have really led the, the whole satellite revolution that's happened in the past decade. Um, yeah, we're definitely trying to uh, make use of that right now also. Right, so just having a quick flip through mm -hmm. the questions that are outstanding. So one of the ones uh, here is, what about the possibility to track fast boats and drug-related traffic? Could you speak to that? So like uh, speedy boats, right? Um, yeah, so yeah, that's so, what so sort of drug cartel, you know, sort of yeah, fast like boats. Yeah, boats and that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like I was showing here earlier. Here, this looks like a small uh, uh, motor craft. I mean, as long as it's captured in a satellite image, we're able to detect it. Um, you know, the, the possible uh, downside would be that it's just, sped, it's just sped across such a small channel that we just didn't get a satellite image photo in time. But we see that um, how frequently uh, the satellite image, satellites are going up in space and just how more and more frequent this gets, that just we're going to keep on getting higher and higher frequency of satellite images as this is just not going to be as much of a problem in the future. Especially get, uh, near the coastal areas, there's usually pretty frequent uh, satellite imaging near these areas. Um, that uh, where these uh, boats are traversing, you know, it's usually a pretty short distance, these cigarette boats. Um, that's not as big of a problem to image frequency like some people might imagine. Thanks. So, um, Jeff Biller at the uh, US Air Force Academy asks um, As this technology advances, could this approach be potentially applied to aircraft? Um, yeah, so uh, if I understand the question correctly, um, you kind of want to uh, use uh, uh, image, image provided from aircraft, like aerial photography from uh, airplanes, I believe that's what you're asking. Um, yeah, that's definitely something we would love to uh, do because, you know, just higher uh, data. So like one thing we're working right now is that we're working through uh, different image sizes and image resolutions. Um, we're trying to use as much possible data because like any uh, big data algorithm, the more data you get, as long as, you know, you sort through it properly, the better your algorithm is going to be. Uh, so yeah, aerial photography or, or that sorts would be uh, definitely very helpful. Um, now, if I'm thinking about the second possible thing of what he's asking to detect aircraft from like uh, hangars. Um, yeah, it could definitely be applied towards that. Um, the problem with that is that like a common way to hide uh, aircraft, like anyone who's uh, familiar with repo people is just to put in a hangar, you know, so it can't be necessarily detected. Uh, we're not able to right now necessarily see through a, a hangar and actually detect aircraft there. But yeah, it's definitely possible if you want to figure out like how uh, big, um, uh, enemies uh, air forces, you can uh, try to figure that out so long it's open um, where you're stored. You can uh, automate, automate that process. Great, and then um, I'll close with, with one last question, which I think is, is, is worth emphasizing is, um, so the output from, from your algorithm and, and your, you know, your company's work, is this gonna be available open source or you know, how, how, are you, um, how are you dealing with kind of the, the product that you produce? Yeah, um, we're looking at multiple avenues right now of like uh, sharing this type of information. Um, we're right now focusing on working with projects with uh, certain people um, on, who are interested in this type of data, but we would uh, really like to, I think, uh, at least have an open source version just to see uh, in certain ports areas where uh, how often the, the boats are appearing there. But we're currently working on that. Okay, Michael, I'm, go I'm gonna call it there. Um, all right, cool, thanks, Jim. Yeah, thank you very much for your time and for presenting what's uh, a really interesting topic and one that's gonna be more prevalent in, in the future as well. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to all of those who joined us so far. We're gonna break for lunch now or whatever meal is appropriate in your part of the world. Uh, and we'll be back at uh, 13.10 um, at Eastern Savings Time. That's um, 10 minutes past 1 p.m. Eastern Savings Time, thanks. Well, thank you all, all of you for joining us this morning uh, for the first session. We, we appreciate that. And we look forward to a really exciting session this afternoon or this evening, wherever you may be. Uh, you know, we heard um, Paul Charre and Michael Tracy talk about some advances in technologies and how they can impact enormous conflict on land and in sea. And we're going to hear from four separate panels this afternoon that are going to address some of those issues, specifically you know, autonomous vessels and AI and LOAC and the potential question of accountability. And of course, you know, futures command and technology on the battlefield. And those four panels are, are sponsored and, and manned by some of our great partners and colleagues here at the War College, uh, Navy Code 10, the Army's National Security Law Division, um, the Paul Tsai China Center at Yale Law School, 
and then of course the Lieber Institute at the uh, United States Military Academy at West Point. Um, but first, we're going to talk about uh, unmanned vessels and for that, we would like to turn to, of course, our CoTEN representatives, and I'd like to introduce our moderator, Margaret Materna. Um, Margaret is the Deputy Director at the National Security Law Division, CoTEN, at the Office of the Judge Advocate General of the Navy. Uh, Margaret, take it away. Good afternoon, and thanks very much, Lieutenant Colonel Cherry, for that introduction. So as mentioned, this panel will focus on autonomy in the maritime context, specifically on unmanned or autonomous vessels. Autonomous vessels are currently envisioned for both government and commercial use and in a variety of combat, surveillance, law enforcement, and general support roles, but they weren't really contemplated by international law. Their use raises some issues common to all systems that employ autonomy, especially if they are designed to exercise belligerent rights. But whether armed or not, they also raise questions unique to the maritime domain and how they will operate in compliance with navigational rules of the road. And the technology is advancing very rapidly. Just last month, one of the U.S. Navy's overlord unmanned surface vessels conducted a first ever transit of the Panama Canal, sailing from Alabama to California, which is over 4,700 nautical miles. 97% of this travel was completed in autonomous mode. So we are moving quickly, but there are still numerous legal questions left to be addressed, some of which are currently being considered by the IMO, and we'll hear a little bit more about that. To start us off, our first speaker will be Lieutenant Commander Joel Quito, who currently serves as a Judge Advocate in the Office of Maritime and International Law at U.S. Coast Guard Headquarters in Washington. So Lieutenant Commander Quito, uh, over to you for your pre-recorded remarks. Good afternoon, friends and colleagues. I'd like to start by thanking Professor James Kraska and the Stockton Center for inviting me to be here today to be a part of this distinguished panel. My remarks on autonomous vessels today will cover three main topics. First, I will talk about the Coast Guard's international work on autonomous vessels at the International Maritime Organization. Next, I'll shift, shift to a domestic perspective, including the Coast Guard's engagement with the maritime sector, as well as the public regarding autonomous vessels. And finally, I will talk about the impact of autonomous vessels across three Coast Guard mission areas. I'd like to also quickly note that my comments today do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the U.S. Coast Guard, the Department of Homeland Security, or the U.S. government. To my first topic, an international perspective on the Coast Guard's autonomous vessel work. The Coast Guard is actively engaged in vessel autonomy issues, both as a regulator of the maritime industry and as a user of the technology itself. Cyber-enabled systems allowed Coast Guard op operations to better accomplish their mission allows industry to innovate, but at the same time raises new concerns that the Coast Guard is acutely aware of in the cyber realm. The Coast Guard's regulatory approach to vessel autonomy is necessarily informed by the discussions and de decisions taken at the International Maritime Organization. In recent years, the IMO has embarked upon a regulatory scoping exercise for the use of maritime autonomous surface ships, or MASS. Scoping exercise seeks to determine how safe, secure, and environmentally responsible autonomous vessel operations might be addressed in IMO instruments. The Coast Guard leads U.S. delegations to the IMO and has been an active participant in this work. The framework for the regulatory scoping exercise anticipates a spectrum of autonomy across four different levels. In degree one, a ship with automated processes and decision support. Degree two, a remotely controlled ship with seafarers on board. Degree three, also remotely controlled, but with no seafarers on board. And finally, in degree four, a fully autonomous ship. The four degrees of autonomy underscore the complexity of the multi-tier analysis required to determine if and to what extent the existing suite of IMO conventions might preclude mass operations, allow them with certain amendments or clarifications, or are simply inapplicable to autonomous vessel operations. As an illustrative example, the International Convention on Standards of Training, Certification, and Watchkeeping for Seafarers, or the STCW Convention, defines the master of a vessel as the person having command of a ship. In degrees one and two with seafarers on board, it is much easier to conclude that there is indeed a master aboard. However, in a degree three remote controlled scenario with no seafarers on board, one must address the thorny question of whether a remote operator perhaps thousands of miles from the ship that he or she controls, can fairly be considered the master of that ship. Similarly, 
For a fully autonomous vessel in degree four, commentators have queried whether a vessel programmer or a machine learning vessel itself might be considered the master of a vessel. While these issues suggest no easy answers, the IMO's work has moved us importantly towards asking the right questions. In addition to its international work at the IMO, the Coast Guard is also considering important domestic legal and policy developments related to autonomous vessels. The Coast Guard is increasingly seeing owners and operators experimenting with autonomous systems. These small-scale operations are generally coordinated with the local captain of the port to ensure the safety of the experimental vessel, the, op the waterway in which they operate, and other vessels that are in the area. To ensure the continued safety of such activities, the Coast Guard will lever leverage its vessel inspection expertise, as well as its unique authorities under the Ports and Waterway Safety Act. The Coast Guard also knows the importance of public engagement, as well as engagement with the maritime sector. To that end, in August, the Coast Guard published in the Federal Register a request for information regarding the integration of automated and autonomous commercial technologies into the maritime transportation system. Among other topics, the Coast Guard sought feedback on existing regulations that may present a challenge to the development or implementation of autonomous technology, potential new regulations that would provide more clarity for the maritime industry, as well as the anticipated impacts of autonomous vessels on the maritime workforce. The Coast Guard received over 40 insightful comments in response to this request. As these numerous responses would suggest, the Coast Guard does not presently have all the answers regarding autonomous vessel technology. Rather, the safe development and adoption of autonomous technology will require constructive, collaborative efforts between the Coast Guard as regulator and the owners and operators deploying these new technologies. Finally, the Coast Guard is very much aware that the integration of autonomous technology presents new cybersecurity threats. As noted in the recently released National Academy of Sciences study entitled Leveraging Unmanned Systems for Coast Guard Missions, unmanned systems can, quote, present cybersecurity vulnerabilities from network-based attacks, as well as from attacks that directly affect the behavior of the vehicles or other physical assets, unquote. To mitigate such threats, the Coast Guard has recently issued guidelines for commercial vessels and waterfront facility operators on how to identify cyber vulnerabilities and has prioritized cyber operations and cyber strategic planning. I want to conclude my remarks today by highlighting new possibilities and new challenges that are raised by autonomous vessels across three core Coast Guard mission areas, search and rescue, counter drug operations, and navigational safety. First, search and rescue. The duty to render assistance at sea is deeply embedded in the nautical tradition, as well as in customary international law as reflected in Article 98 of the Law of the Sea Convention. That article, while directed at the flag state, requires the master of a ship flying the flag to render assistance to any person in peril at sea. Thus, in the context of search and rescue, the question of who, if anyone, is the master of an autonomous vessel takes on special significance. Indeed, if one reaches the conclusion that there can be no master of a mass, it is necessary to ask whether the legal duty to render assistance persists. For our purposes today, it is enough to say that there have been no definitive answers as to who is the master of an autonomous vessel, particularly at levels three and level four in the IMO taxonomy. As these at these advanced levels of autonomy, where no seafarers are present, I would suggest that the key inquiry becomes if and when an autonomous ship has so improved in understanding of and capability to render assistance that it becomes obligated to do so. Next, drug interdiction. Among the challenges of interdicting narcotics traffic at sea is the vast operating area, often described as the tyranny of distance. Indeed, the Western Hemisphere Transit Zone, a known corridor for drug production and delivery, spans some 7 million square miles. For some perspective, that's about twice the size of the continental United States. Because these vast distances strain finite enforcement assets and cloak illicit activity, leveraging autonomous technology is essential to enhancing maritime domain awareness. Autonomous vessels might someday offer the following potential advantages greater presence and endurance on the water, resulting from reduced fuel consumption and the elimination of crew rest requirements. 
enhanced detection capability through an optimized sensor technology or integrated audio or visual communication system. And third, overall reduced operating costs. Unfortunately, law enforcement and naval forces are unlikely to be the only customers in the autonomous vessel market. Indeed, the evolution of maritime drug trafficking from the repurposed trawler to the present day narcotics submarine has consistently leveraged technology. This history suggests that the advent of autonomous vessels will inure to the benefit not only of Coast Guard and Naval forces, but also to the criminal entities they seek to interdict. Finally, navigational safety. As the federal government's designated center of excellence for navigation safety, the Coast Guard will play a pivotal role in shaping navigational rules and policies in an increasingly automated world. A crucial part of that work will involve the Convention on the International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea, better known as the coal regs. However, certain coal regs raise apparent issues for mass compliance, including Rule 5, which states in relevant part that every vessel shall at all times maintain a proper lookout by sight and hearing. The ability of an autonomous vessel to comply with Rule 5 turns on what is meant by sight and hearing. For example, whether a sufficiently robust suite of audio and visual sensors could serve as the functional equivalent of a lookout. Relatedly, Rule 2 notes that responsibility within the meaning of the coal regs includes any precaution which may be required by the ordinary practice of seamen. As noted by the IMO Intercessional Working Group on Mass, these provisions are imbued with, quote, human-centric wording, unquote, not obviously applicable to autonomous systems. Moreover, as noted by Professor Craig Allen of the University of Washington School of Law, unlike the SOLAS or STCW conventions, the coal regs do not include provisions for the substitution of equivalents for its requirements. In conclusion, while the above questions have no easy or settled answers, the U.S. Coast Guard is committed to ensuring the safety of navigation and the protection of life and property at sea, including the safe operation of both manned and unmanned vessels. I want to thank you for your kind attention today, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Lieutenant Commander Quito. I uh, really appreciate hearing the Coast Guard perspective and that update on IMO discussions. Our next speaker will be Dr. Anna Patrick, who is the Chair of International Law and Public Law at the University of Basel in Switzerland. Dr. Patrick, thanks very much for joining us. I believe you're overseas, so we particularly appreciate it. Over to you. I would like to welcome you to my presentation on autonomous vessels and maritime security, regulatory challenges in the context of the SUA Convention. And I would like to express my warmest thanks to the organizer for the opportunity to present at this very interesting conference. There are two reasons that led me to focus on the SUA Convention. First, the SUA Convention is subject to the regulatory scoping exercise conducted within the IMO. The previous speaker gave you an overview about this exercise. Second, autonomous systems that can be used for enforcement purposes are announced at ever shorter intervals and at the same time, unmanned vehicles are already being used to commit acts that could amount to SUA offenses. I'm thinking of attacks in the style of those carried out by Houthi rebels with explosive laden remote controlled crafts. Well, considering the full spectrum of anticipated ship automation technology, we're arguably still at the very low end of the scale at the horseless carriage stage of this emerging technology. Remote controlled offender ships, for example, are not very, very far away from the invention made by the scientist Tesla in 1898 who presented a remote controlled toy boat with flashing lights during the electrical exhibition on New York's Madison Square Garden pond. Technology is set to make a giant leap in the uh, near future. However, already quite rudimentary technology challenges uh, the foundations of the law, because the law rests on the assumption that ships carry an onboard crew responsible for navigation and the ship's task and mission. And with unmanned ships, this assumption is thrown overboard. The 
question whether the law is fit for purpose already arises with remote controlled boats and we do not need to wait for more advanced technology. Let me provide you with some examples of the SUA convention where it is unclear whether the law is fit for purpose in the age of autonomous ships. I start with SUA offenses, with the offense definitions. So offenses can be roughly categorized in three types of offenses. First, there are offenses prohibiting to harm another ship. The wording of these offenses does not specify the means by which a victim ship is harmed, so you could technically use an unmanned ship to cause harm. However, do remote operators fall under the provisions? Do those launching a system, pre-programming a system, fall under that provision? This is less clear. Second, there are offensive prohibiting to use a ship as a weapon. Here again, we are quite lucky that the SUA Convention defines ships in a very broad manner as a vessel of any type whatsoever, not permanently attached to the seabed. The definition may cover ships without crew, however, use among states may differ. Third, the transportation offenses prohibit using a ship to transport illicit cargo. Again, the term transport is defined very broadly as a means to exercise effective control over the movement of an item. So with remote controlled vessels, this notion could be fulfilled. However, whether the same holds true for fully autonomous vessels is less clear. Overall, the definitions may encompass the commission of SUA offenses through the use of autonomous ships. However, states may interpret the provisions differently and there is a need for clarification. Second, the SUA defines who is authorized to enforce SUA offenses and there are essentially two conditions. First, the craft must qualify as a warship or a statecraft marked, identifiable as being on government service and authorized to enforce the law. I will not further elaborate on that issue because the next speaker will cover it in depth. Second, the SUA Convention explicitly mentions that only an official from such craft is entitled to enforce the law. Can a remote controller be deemed to be an official from such craft? What if a person launches a fully autonomous system? Is that an official from such craft? Such questions arise in the context of the SUA Convention. Interpretative issues also arise in the context of safeguards. They rest on the premise that enforcers and suspects meet at sea in theater. They are tailored to human-human interaction. Further, they often refer to physical documents to prove a specific fact like ID cards of officials or ship papers. To provide you with an example, the SUA stipulates that officials must produce an ID card for examination by the master when taking enforcement action. What is the meaning of this provision in case there is not a human-human, but rather a human-machine or even a machine-machine interaction? What does it imply for interaction and communication? What is the functional equivalent to a physical document, an ID card. Well, uncertainties of this type raise the question about the appropriate level to clarify these issues to regulate autonomous ships. Is it domestic or international? And I guess a combined approach is necessary. The SUA Convention belongs to the so-called suppression treaties. The mechanics of this type of convention is the following. They are rooted in the idea of harmonizing domestic criminal law in order to pave the way for at sea enforcement and interstate cooperation in criminal matters. If we do not want to prejudice the harmonization idea, I guess there is a need to renew our common understanding what the SUA provisions mean in the context of autonomous ships. In my view, the common understanding of what SUA provisions mean do not need to be entrenched in a new treaty provision, I very much share the concern, concern of opening up this treaty. Rather, it seems to suffice to issue a unified interpretation or a similar type of document. Without such common interpretation or understanding, however, I doubt whether the idea behind the SUA Convention 
harmonization of domestic law to enable international criminal cooperation can be realized in the future. The IMO regulatory scoping exercise is to be commended because it's a, it notably raises awareness among IMO member states about autonomous ships and it also allows for a first inventory of legal challenges. However, it also has some limitations and I would like to mention three of them. First, the scoping exercise entailed a provision by provision examination. There has not been much room to consider the entire mechanics of the treaty and to discuss whether it is disturbed through the use of autonomous ships. As regards the SUA, this may be the case because the treaty functioning is predicated on suspects being at sea. There is a shipboarding procedure. It is foreseen that suspects are arrested at sea. With crewless offender ships, arrest at sea will be not possible in most of the cases. And this entails a shift, a shift to land-based enforcement measures, which the treaty does not authorize. So offenders vessels without crew may impact the entire mechanics and efficiency of the SUA convention. A second limitation accrues from the focus of the scoping exercise. It only reviewed existing law. Such narrow focus does not provide a full picture of the regulatory challenges posed by the introduction of autonomous ships, since new technologies will bring up entirely new issues not regulated in the existing law. Some of these issues can already be anticipated. For example, there is the issue of machine-based decision-making. The law defines various thresholds, notably um, the threshold of reasonable grounds of suspicion. These thresholds were so far subjected to human judgment. The question is therefore, can a machine engage in such assessment? Another non-regulated aspect is how, uh, what is the value of machine-generated Evidence, is it possible to base a criminal prosecution on machine generated evidence solely? Evidence not corroborated by human perception? And how would you challenge this type of evidence in court? And I guess here the discussion is a bit more advanced in US criminal law doctrine than it is in Europe. Then there are the known unknowns and unknown unknowns. I guess today we simply lack experience and imagination to predict the legal challenges new pieces of technology will bring. Hence, the situation needs to be continuously assessed. Ideally, lawyers work closely together with experts in technology and the fact that this will be an ongoing exercise brings me to the last limitation of the IMO scoping exercise. The methodology of the IMO scoping exercise was such that states could only choose among three options as regards the way forward. Interpret treaties, amend treaties and create new treaty rules. Hence, the focus is very much on hard law treaties, traditional forms of lawmaking. However, is treaty making really a suitable method to regulate emerging technologies? I have some reservations because of the speed of the technological development. There has always been a pacing problem. Throughout history, technology has always outpaced law. However, the rate of technological change accelerated quite dramatically and innovation cycles become shorter and shorter. This exacerbates the pacing problem and also the regulatory challenge. It is against this background that there is a need to discuss on how to best regulate emerging technologies. Is, for example, soft law better suited than hard law? And should we um, move from a rule-based approach to principle-based regulation? I gave you the example uh, on the rule that the officials need to produce an ID card for examination upon the master. Maybe in the future, it suffices to have a rule in hard law which states that we need legal certainty when enforcing uh, the law, but then the specific details would be regulated through soft law, which can be adapted more easily.
Well, these are some of the challenges which are involved in the regulation of autonomous ships and which pertain to the SUA Convention specifically, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Petrick. We really appreciate hearing your remarks. Uh, our final speaker this afternoon on the panel will be Professor Pete Pedroso, who is the Howard S. Levy Chair on the Law of Armed Conflict and Professor of International Law at the Stockton Center at the U.S. Naval War College. He's also a retired captain in the U.S. Navy JAG Corps. Professor Pedroso, over to you for your remarks. Thank you, Margaret, and thanks uh, to uh, everyone for participating today. Good day to all of you, wherever you may be. Um, I have the next slide, please. And the next slide. Okay, I'm going to be talking, as was mentioned, uh, primarily about uh, uh, autonomous or unmanned systems in a uh, naval uh, uh, warfare con uh, construct. Uh, but why are we talking about this? We've uh, already have seen uh, over the last 20 years of uh, warfare uh, in uh, in the Middle East that uh, unmanned systems do provide some uh, um, advantages and have been proven in combat. Uh, they, uh, because of their mobility uh, and their ability to uh, uh, loiter on, on station for extended periods of time, they enhance situational awareness for missions such as intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Uh, they also uh, um, reduce human workload. You know, we have a P-8 aircraft that has nine crew members on board uh, with an uh, unmanned aerial vehicle doing surveillance. You're going to have uh, one, one uh, joystick operator uh, back at Creech Air Force Base. Uh, or somewhere else. Um, you also, uh, the unmanned systems also improve mission performance because of the stealth technology that they employ, uh, which makes them much more survivable uh, than a manned uh, um, platform. And it uh, minimizes overall risk to uh, military and civilian personnel by allowing for remote operation away from the battlefield and enhanced targeting capabilities. And all of this is at a reduced cost, uh, which is important in today's uh, uh, budgetary uh, world. Uh, you can get six Reapers, for example, for the price of one uh, F-35 aircraft. Next slide, please. So these uh, unmanned systems are ideal for dull missions, uh, as I mentioned, like uh, uh, ISR, which is very mundane, uh, requires long uh, duration on station. Uh, they're also uh, well suited for dirty missions, like uh, detection of chemical, biological, and nuclear materials and uh, th by reducing the exposure to uh, uh, personnel uh, that would uh, be exposed to these hazardous conditions on the battlefield. And finally, they can also conduct inherently dangerous missions, uh, such as uh, mine clearing operations or deactivation of uh, improvised explosive devices. Uh, we saw in uh, the uh, recent uh, COVID outbreak when it first started in Wuhan, uh, the Chinese were using uh, unmanned systems to develop uh, uh, to their first responders uh, um, rather than send um, man personnel with, uh, into the area. Next slide, please. As Margaret already mentioned, uh, these things are coming and they're coming fast. Uh, Overload uh, was tested uh, in September of this year on a six-week cruise, departed Mobile, Alabama, uh, conducted some operations in the Gulf of Mexico, then transited the Panama Canal and arrived at Port Wainimi uh, six weeks later. Uh, uh, as she mentioned, 4,700 nautical miles, 97% of which was in an autonomous mode. Next slide, please. Now, the vision for these uh, systems, they're going to be under the command of uh, the Surface Development Squadron 1, based out of San Diego, California. Uh, the uh, vision is to establish a command and control node ashore that will be manned 24-7 uh, uh, as an unmanned operations center by uh, surface warfare officers surface warfare officer qualified personnel, as well as senior enlisted personnel trained in the collision regulations and ship handling. Next slide, please. So what are these things? Are they a, a, a ship? Are they a device? Uh, if you look at a uh, number of the uh, uh, IMO documents that uh, define ship or vessel, uh, they all have one thing in common. None of them say that you have to have a person on board. Uh, so that's, uh, I think that's an important point that as they go through this scoping exercise that needs to be considered and not uh, uh, be overly conservative and try to say that you have to have person on board uh, a device or a, or a conveyance in order for it to be considered a ship or a vessel. Next slide, please. 
Now, Article 94 of UNCLOS does uh, seem to indicate of a, ma a manning requirement. Again, it talks about uh, that each ship should be under the charge of a master. It should have a crew on board, uh, that the master, the officers, and the crew should be conversant and applicable in international regulations with regard to safety at life at sea, the coal rag, uh, the prevention, reduction, control of marine pollution, et cetera. Again, there's nothing in UNCLOS, however, that says that the master or the crew have to be on board the vessel. Next slide. And as uh, Joel already mentioned, uh, we've got this, uh, the mass uh, um, work that's being done at IMO uh, that eventually the, the, uh, the projection is that at some point we will have remote and autonomous ocean going vessels uh, in the not too distant future. Next slide, please. Next slide, you know, we already covered that. Okay, one of the things uh, that uh, ongoing in conjunction with the IMO work, we have this uh, non-governmental organization that is participating in the work at the IMO and a survey that they sent out uh, to a number of states, uh, 17 out of the 19 states that responded indicated that unmanned maritime systems could be considered ships under their, their domestic law. So that's an important point that needs to be uh, taken into consideration as the IMO goes through its uh, scoping uh, exercise. Next slide, please. So again, what are they? Ship, device, not everything's going to be considered a ship or a vessel. Um, it, uh, um, let me make sure I'm not running over time here. Okay. Uh, not everything's going to be a ship or, or a vessel. If you look at the, on the left there, that, uh, ocean glider probably is not going to be considered a ship or a vessel. However, the, uh, the, uh, sea hunter that's on the right side certainly looks like a ship, smells like a ship, and probably at some point in the, in the near future is going to be considered a ship. Next slide, please. Again, the uh, Navy, uh, for purposes of navigational rights, we consider that these unmanned uh, uh, underwater and unmanned surface uh, vessels all enjoy the same navigational freedoms uh, that manned vessels uh, can exercise, including innocent passage, archipelagic sea lanes passage, transit passage through international state, and high seas freedoms beyond the territorial sea. And again, the NGO would agree with that, that uh, maritime unmanned uh, vessels do enjoy the same navigational rights as manned ships. Again, assuming that they can comply with the, uh, the applicable uh, regulations such as coal rates. Next slide, please. The, uh, you see the definition of warship first uh, originating in the 1907 Hague Convention. It talks about uh, the, the ship has to be under the direct authority or control of uh, the flag state. It has to be, uh, have external markings. It's gotta be commanded by a duly commissioned officer and it has to have a crew subject to military discipline. Next slide, please. That definition uh, has carried over into uh, the, both the 1958 High Seas Convention, as well as in Article 29 of the uh, 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Next slide, please. And in our military manuals, we see that the DOD Law War Manual, as well as the Commander's Handbook and the Law of Naval Operations, uh, also adopt the same definition that you find in UNCLOS. Again, I would suggest that none of these documents require that the commander or crew be on board the vessel. Next slide, please. Why is this important? Well, we go back to 1856, uh, the Declaration of Paris uh, abolished privateering. Um, that was advanced then in the, uh, in the Hague Convention of, uh, of 1907 that uh, talked about uh, uh, converting merchant ships into, into warships, the uh, Naval, uh, the Oxford Manual, same thing, privateering for, uh, forbidden. And it was all getting down to the point that only warships can engage in belligerent acts uh, during an, a, an international armed conflict. Uh, and you can see that both the DOD Law War Manual and the Commander's Handbook on the Law of Naval Operations adopt this, uh, this position, even though the United States is not a party to either the Paris Declaration or to Hague, uh, Hague 7. Next slide, please. But as you can see on this slide, there are a number of mission sets that are being uh, identified for unmanned maritime systems that are going to require that they engage in belligerent acts, which means that the, some of these uh, unmanned systems are going to have to be designated warships if we want to be in compliance with, with, the, uh, with, with international law. Next slide, please. And again, not all these uh, systems need to be 
declared as a warship because you can see that the common USV that's deployed from the littoral combat ship. Uh, it conducts. Uh, it can conduct belligerent acts, that, and it will do so as an extension of the uh, of the warship, not in an uh, in an inherent right in and of itself. Next slide. However, if you see the Sea Hunter or the large orc underwater uh, vehicle, these things are not going to be launched from a from a warship. They're going to be launched from land base somewhere, and then they're going to proceed uh, several thousand miles to their to their uh, destination, and they're going to engage in belligerent acts. Therefore, these types of vessels at some point are going to have to be designated warships uh, under the under U.S. Uh, uh, process. Next slide, please. And that process begins with the Chief of Naval Operations. Uh, Article 40406 of Navy Regulations identifies the Chief of Naval Operations as a person responsible for the Naval Vessel Register and assignment and classification uh, of waterborne craft and designation of status of each ship in the service. And then there's some additional uh, um, Instructions that uh, that apply that uh, and and the U.S. laws that apply that would uh, um, that would require uh, that that would allow for the designation of an unmanned system to be a warship. But the the, the issue is this has to be done sooner rather than later, and the the, uh, the Navy has to get uh, get off the ball and start uh, um, designating these uh, these larger type vessels as warships so that we can establish state practice uh, to go into the future. And thank you very much. Hey, Margaret, you're muted. My apologies. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Pedroso, and thank you to all of our panelists this afternoon for their thoughtful contributions on this topic. Uh, we're now going to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, and I would ask all of our speakers to turn on their mics and cameras if they haven't already, um, and we'll go from there. Uh, so one of the first questions which kind of dovetails nicely with some of the work that we're doing right now in the Navy um, is distinguishing between what is a weapon system and what is a warship. Uh, and so this question was specifically for Professor Pedroso, but we certainly welcome any thoughts on the subject uh, from any of our panelists. So can an autonomized weaponized vessel be considered a very big torpedo and treated as such? Well, I guess it could be considered a torpedo, but uh, um, we have torpedoes. Uh, so I would, uh, I would suggest that, uh, why call it a torpedo if it's not a torpedo? Uh, the, there are some of these systems that, uh, some of the submerged, uh, the underwater, uh, um, unmanned uh, underwater vehicles are uh, very well could act as a torpedo, uh, but that's not how they're designated. Um, so I, I, would, I would suggest that the, the answer to the question is no, that uh, these are, are, should not be considered large torpedoes. Thanks very much. And our next question is probably best for uh, Lieutenant Commander Quito, as you were discussing some of the cyber issues uh, with unmanned systems. So some of the checks and balances that might be envisioned to overcome, you know, the vulnerability to hacking and cyber crimes with autonomous vessels. Uh, so one of our uh, audience uh, members has asked if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Sure, I'd be happy to. And I'd say the, the Coast Guard's increased focus on cyber threats is certainly not unique to the autonomous vessel context. Uh, we're looking at cyber risk across uh, waterfront facilities and ports. Um, so this, uh, the context of autonomous vessels is really uh, one example among many of um, the sort of risks inherent with um, increasingly automated technologies, um, remote capabilities uh, across a number of uh, networks. So uh, I would say that to answer that question, the, the Coast Guard's really looking uh, not just at um, kind of the, the navigational issues that I uh, referenced during my prepared remarks, um, as far as navigational safety in a narrow sense, just the, you know, the safe navigation of the vessel through the water, uh, but what that vessel might be subject to, to in terms of uh, cyber intrusions. So it's um, it's really cyber, cyber risks are not something that can be uh, narrowly tailored, I would say, to one context, but we're taking a, a much broader view, if that helps. If I may add, during the regulatory scoping exercise, the problem of uh, 
autonomous ships being hacked has been identified as a transversal issue and one of the core issues and the CMI has even suggested whether we need to introduce a new offense which would be a cybercrime against ships and others argue that the SUA convention already includes such an offense. There is this uh, crime which says that a person who places on a ship by means whatsoever a device which can cause harm to the ship um, is liable to punishment. So if we interpret that broadly, it could also be placing a malware uh, on board ships. So uh, this is certainly one of the uh, keys, key issues to be discussed uh, within the scope of the regulatory scoping exercise. Great. Thank you both very much. Uh, and Dr. Petrick, I think you kind of alluded to this in your remarks. Uh, we have, you know, an ongoing struggle between whether a new legal framework is needed or whether existing legal frameworks are sufficient to address autonomous vessels and their use uh, and the variety of potential uses for them. And so, and, you know, along with that are the coal regs, which as Joel mentioned, uh, some of those requirements might be a little bit difficult to comply with, such as the one for a lookout. Uh, so I open this question to all of our panelists. Uh, do we need a new legal regime? Are existing uh, laws sufficient? Um, and if they are sufficient, do they need to be amended? Or is it just a matter of interpretation and application? I think I, think I can start taking uh, a stab at that. W one thing that I would note, you mentioned specifically the coal regs. Um, the way that the coal regs are currently drafted, the concept of responsibility uh, actually makes it a requirement uh, that you that the mariner would know not just when to follow the rules, but when collision avoidance might actually require a departure from the rules. So one thing I think I'd like to note at the outset is there's still, an, you know, we, we've mentioned that the technology is progressing quickly, but, you know, is there is there an algorithm that's been developed yet uh, that can not only show an autonomous vessel how to follow rules, but also know when to break them? And I think uh, until that level of technology uh, has been reached or has at least been approached, we're still going to be in a, a process where developing guidelines and best practices are going to be necessary before we can uh, definitively start marching out on regulatory changes. If we look at the results of the, the interim results of the regulatory scoping exercise, it's quite clear that um, the appetite to have new treaties or amend treaties is not very big and uh, states at the current juncture they favor interpretations and if the IMO or um, a conference of state parties issues guidance that could also amount to a subsequent agreement regarding the interpretation of these treaties and that could be then uh, an important element for the interpretation of these treaties. Maybe there are limits uh, to interpretation. Um, some issues may be solved. You can find a functional equivalence for many uh, things. I guess uh, this term has been used by uh, Joel Coito in his presentation, my presentation. Um, but I guess there are also some new issues which are not yet addressed in uh, the existing law, as I stressed in my presentation, because the issues are new. Uh, non-existing and not regulated and there I guess um, it will be difficult to just um, operate uh, through interpretation, reinterpretation of the law and we may have um, new rules but I doubt whether uh, formal law, treaty law is the best way to proceed because it's very slow whereas technology is very fast and so I guess um, soft law guidelines will uh, be better suited to develop the law. It also allows for a trial and error approach. We can adjust to new technology because to some extent we regulate the unknown. And um, I don't know whether a treaty is not um, too rigid for this type of fast evolving technology. On the other hand, um, treaties provide you with much more certainty, uh, not only the enforcers or those subject to enforcement, but also the industry, it's uh, clear what is expected from them. Whereas if different actors issue guidelines, you, guidance, you may also have uh, a situation where it's not quite clear what's the authoritative uh, uh, rule is. 
I, I would agree that uh, we don't need the new legal regime. I think we need some creative interpretation. Um, with regards to coal regs, uh, um, look out. I would suggest that a, uh, um, that a sensor system can be every bit as, uh, as competent as a person uh, looking through a pair of big eyes um, that, uh, and probably, probably do a better job uh, than, a, than a man lookout could do. But again, it, it, it's going to all depend on how technology develops. Uh, and once to, it, if we can't develop the technology uh, to the level of satisfaction to that, we can, that we can say it can, can comply with the existing legal regime, then uh, they shouldn't be done. But I think at some point in the near future, uh, they are going to come up with the technology that's going to allow uh, these uh, un unmanned systems to operate at sea, uh, just like a manned ship does. Hey, thank you, everyone. Uh, we only have about three minutes left, uh, but we do still have a couple of questions. Uh, so one question has a lot to do with attribution and responsibility. Uh, so autonomous platforms may display unpredictable behaviors. Uh, so how much control should a remote master have over the platform to still be considered responsible for its behavior. Uh, so maybe if we could kind of talk even a little bit more broadly about responsibility in that context. Professor Pedroza, perhaps I'll start with you since you're still up on my screen. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, I think that as long as the, uh, the, uh, the person that is remotely operating the vessel um, is going to be the person that's going to be held responsible for any uh, uh, transgressions that that unmanned vessel may uh, may perform. Now, if you're talking purely autonomous vessel, uh, then you're all, you're not going to have anybody that's operating them because if, theoretically, it's, if it's purely autonomous, then you have no one in control. So uh, the flag state's going to bear responsibility uh, as it should. Um, it, it, if it's flagged under a certain country, then the flag state bears responsibility for any. Uh, um, uh, transgressions that that ship may uh, may commit. I agree that um, remote controlled uh, ships are arguably not very problematic in terms of attribution, at least in criminal law, you still have a human being who takes decisions and continues uh, to be responsible for the effective control of uh, the ship or the device. However, if it's uh, pre-programmed or even if it can learn en route, it becomes more difficult to attribute. Uh, uh, the more distant the human involvement is, the more difficult attribution is. I think from the, the Coast Guard perspective, from a, a navigational safety point of view, uh, degree two, you know, the remote controlled operation with a master still on board actually um, is quite interesting in that it raises some questions about what is, what is the level of uh, intrusiveness, so to speak, of that onboard backup person. I think the touchstone for safe navigation has always been fundamentals of prudent seamanship. So do we worry about a scenario where uh, that backup uh, on board a, a, a degree two type of autonomous system is not performing uh, to an adequate degree that that safety backup function? So I think that's um, even where you have the quote unquote safety of someone aboard, I think there, there's more work that needs to be done to define uh, the scope of their responsibility or oversight of that autonomous system. So maybe to build on that a little bit, uh, we have a question about whether if a vessel is cyber attacked uh, and the attacker takes control of it, your calculus changes at all. Uh, so who then has the responsibility? And it appears we have stumped the panel with that question. <laughs> It depends the responsibility for what, uh, for the safe navigation, or is it about like if there is a damage cost for uh, the damage? I guess the, the question is too complex to, for an easy answer. Okay, well, that brings us to 2 p.m., which is the end of our time. Uh, so I really want to thank all of our panelists for their excellent comments this afternoon. Uh, and I see Lieutenant Colonel Cherry is online. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Margaret. That was a fantastic panel. Um, thank you to our three panelists. Uh, certainly interesting. And uh, as we go into our break, um, we will next hear from uh, the Army. So we'll be going from the Navy to the Army and going from the water to the land. Uh, as a Marine, I'm a 
good person to transition us there. So I will come back in about 10 minutes uh, and we will see you then for our next panel. Thanks again, Margaret, and thanks to our panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, hello and welcome back from the break. Uh, our next panel titled Artificial Intelligence in the Law of Armed Conflict uh, is co-sponsored today by the Army's National Security Law Division. And uh, from that division, our moderator, uh, is Mike Meyer, and, and Mike is the Special Assistant to the Judge Advocate General of the Army and for Law War Matters. Um, with that, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, John, and um, welcome everyone to our panel. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're at. Um, we, as John said, our panel is going to be entitled Artificial Intelligence and the Law of Armed Conflict. Uh, certainly, I want to uh, express my thanks to the Stockton Center for the invitation to participate here today. We have seen over time the increasing use of autonomy in weapons systems. New innovations in technology, such as the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning, have the potential to dramatically transform how the U.S. military fights and how DOD will operate in the future. To date, we have seen some of the benefits of autonomy and the motive to increase levels of autonomy in weapons systems can yield even greater benefits, greater operational effectiveness, increased safety of one's own forces, decreasing the need for personnel and financial savings. With respect to the law of armed conflict, we have seen that autonomy can improve accuracy of weapon systems, provides better ISR that allows commanders and operators to make better, better targeting decisions. Technologies have shaped warfare in the past and these new technologies may prove to be even more dispensable parts of military arsenals in the future. A wide variety of artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies are currently pursued by governments worldwide. Certainly, the United States is not alone in this endeavor. According to Pres uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin, artificial intelligence is the future, not only for Russia, but for all humankind. It comes with colossal opportunities, but also threats that are difficult to predict. Whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. Similarly, China's new generation AI development plan states that AI is strategic technology that will lead the future. And in relation to military applications, it is said that artificial intelligence will lead to profound military revolution. These new technologies provide great promise, but they also prevent many challenges, and our panelists will discuss those today. I'm pleased to be joined by two distinguished panelists on this panel. Our first one is Ashley Lorenz, who is the Chief of Intelligence Systems Centers at John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Ashley is the founding director of the Intelligence Systems Center, uh, where he directs research and development activities in machine learning, robotic and autonomous systems, and applied neuroscience. He's been with APL since 2003, and his background is in machine learning and signal processing applied to autonomous systems. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, one of the perils of making your uh, LinkedIn page open to everyone. In addition to his career as an engineer, Ashley has also pursued a parallel career as a hip hop artist and a producer and serves as a voting member of the Recording Academy. So with that, uh, let's please uh, run Ashley's presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Lorenz. I'm with the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. And my remarks this afternoon will focus on perspectives on intelligent systems. So I'll caveat right away by saying that uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a scholar of law, rather I'm a technologist and my aim will be to bring a technology perspective to hopefully ground some of the discussion today. Um, and let me just say a quick thank you to the US Naval War College Stockton Center for the opportunity to participate in this important discussion. All right, I'm gonna to try to make three points today, and I'm going to use uh, examples from research and development underway at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab to try to illustrate these three points. The first being intelligent systems empower people, uncertainty is hard for humans and machines, and the third is that intelligence is contextual, and hopefully it'll be clear uh, by the end what I mean by these and why they're relevant to today. First point, intelligent systems empower people. So let's take a look at this at this diagram. We've got uh, Johnny in the foreground, uh, he, who's an amputee, wearing uh, a very advanced robotic prosthetic. This was developed by a, a, a program called DARPA, um, revolutionizing prosthetics. It was led by APL um, and many different collaborators over a number of decades. And I call this an AI-assisted handshake. And so Johnny is using this prosthetic to shake hands 
um, with Jen through the robot that's also in the foreground, Robo Sally. Okay, so so how is you know how is artificial intelligence helping to empower uh, this AI assisted handshake? So it is helping. Um, it is perceiving and understanding its environment. It's making decisions on how to act according <clears throat> according to the intent of these two individuals. It's carrying out that intent with some degree of autonomy, and it's doing so as part of a team. In the case of Johnny's prosthetic, it is perceiving its environment. Its environment is Johnny's nervous system. Uh, it's got to interpret the motor intent. That's the state. That's the perception aspect. It's got to um, decide on how to actuate itself according to that intent, carry it out with some autonomy. Okay. And then you've got Jen in the background and actually instead of measuring her intent directly as the system is doing with Johnny, it's observing from afar, uh, just a little bit of a distance there through an infrared sensor. It's got an internal model of hand movements uh, and it's reasoning about how uh, Sally should move itself um, according to that intent. All right, so in each case, uh, these intelligent systems are perceiving, deciding, acting, as part of a team. And this is a real illustration for how uh, intelligent systems should empower people. Now, I'm using the term intelligent systems. Uh, you know, we're here to talk about artificial intelligence. I just want to make the quick point that um, if we think about AI and machine learning um, as, as algorithms and families of technologies, intelligent systems are how we put those technologies together um, in order to, to create these agents for, for human beings. Okay, so that's our perspective on uh, kind of a systems view on artificial intelligence. Now, on the right-hand side, you see the same robotic system, Sally, with these two modular prosthetic limbs. But this time, uh, the use case is, is more what we would call an intelligent autonomous system or a system that acts with a higher degree of autonomy. This is a marsupial robotic team. And in this case, a human being or a set of humans can uh, direct this system from afar, uh, removed in time and space, and it will make decisions autonomously as to which robot in the team should, should perform which task. And so here envision a system, for example, that may be um, going into a hostile area, doing a surveillance task so that humans can stay out of harm's way. So even though this is a system that can operate uh, kind of at a distance from humans, um, it's not fully autonomous, it's part of a human workflow. In this case, the humans are outside of the scene, but still, uh, the system is fundamentally part of a human machine team. So people up close or people far away, um, intelligent systems uh, should empower people. Now, let's talk about the role of machine learning in this. Uh, in, each one of these, in each one of the cases that I showed before, um, the prosthetic example, uh, the autonomous systems example, you had machine learning capabilities helping the machine to perceive the state of the world. And so recent advancements in artificial intelligence are well illustrated through computer vision. And that's what's shown here. So even the ability of a system to take in lots of pixels in full motion video and repeatedly and accurately put bounding boxes around uh, pre-specified objects in the scene or object classes um, and to uh, label those classes with some degree of, of accuracy, a high degree of accuracy is a relatively recent phenomenon, last decade. And so that's what we're seeing here. But as much of, uh, as this is an illustration of the capabilities, when I play this video, you'll see um, an illustration of some of the limitations. So what Neil has done here, and Neil is uh, my colleague here in the video, is program a backdoor into the system. So he went into the training set and introduced this pattern to half of the people. And so what the machine does now uh, is when there's a person co-located with this pattern, it thinks they're teddy bears. And it's just as happy to call them a teddy bear. It's an illustration of uh, the system is not reasoning about the patterns that it's observing. Um, this can make it vulnerable to many different kinds of real world perturbation, including adversarial. And so as much as this is an illustration of the capabilities offered by machine learning, it's also an illustration of the limitations. Now, over the last few years, what we've done is actually create a technology roadmap that recognizes where we are. So um, this is a radial map where time radiates outward from the lower left. And where we are is kind of what I just alluded to in terms of machine learning, uh, sort of uh, powering uh, the latest wave of artificial intelligence. Machines can recognize patterns in data. What we're really trying to do now is better understand how to utilize machine learning to engineer intelligent systems. And in order to do that, we think we need to advance along these four dimensions or these four technology vectors. 
Um, the perceived aspect of systems recognizing patterns in data needs to become more autonomous over time, autonomous perception. Machines need to be able to put uh, patterns into context. Um, so decision and action become superhuman decision-making and autonomous action. So more and more, we, we, we're trying to invest in advancing the ability of machines to decide for themselves based on context, dynamically evolving context uh, nonetheless, how to take appropriate action. So with the machine deciding how to act. Um, the team aspect becomes human machine teaming at the speed of thought. So imagine if um, with the level of intuition and intuitiveness that Johnny can control that prosthetic. Imagine being able to command a system at, at a distance in time and space um, with that same uh, level of intuition. And that's our vision there. Um, eventually getting to a, a notion of shared intent and shared cognition. And then finally, safe and assured operation, which really enables uh, the use of intelligent systems in these challenging mission spaces that uh, involve uncertainty, uh, and which I'll get to in my next point, and, and all the complexities of the real world. So this is really uh, a key enabler for, for the value proposition. This is our vision of where the research is headed and, and the investments that we're making. Okay, intelligent systems empower people, first point. Second point, uncertainty is hard for humans and machines. And this is a point that I think is often undervalued in conversations around artificial intelligence, the role of uncertainty, the complexity of uncertainty. And I'll illustrate this through an example uh, test bed that APL uh, created to study this phenomenon of decision-making under uncertainty called reconnaissance blind chess. It's a simple twist on traditional chess um, that involves uncertainty and sensing. So in this board, when white makes its first move, uh, black is confronted with around 20 different possibilities of what the board state might be and only gets to observe the, th the true board state through sensing actions that reveal the location of pieces only in a subset of the board. And so if black senses uh, sense as well, the whole uh, information uh, space or information set as we call it collapses to a single possibility. But if black doesn't sense uh, in the right space, in the right spaces, um, then black is confronted with an information set, a number of possibilities in order to uh, decide uh, in, uh, what an optimal move might be. And so if you look at the level of complexity, if you think about the game tree of chess, so all the different ways that the game might play out, um, you go from something like 10 to the 43, which is still a really big number. If you add this kind of uncertainty, you go to something more like 10 to the 178 uh, possibilities for how the game might play out. All right. And that explosion of um, the state space and, and the information uncertainty, it actually breaks uh, modern machine learning algorithms, even the kind that, that are responsible for the superhuman gameplay in games like Go that we've seen. And so again, I hope what this does is illustrates the complexity that um, uncertainty imposes. Now you can imagine this is just a board game and already uh, just imposing this level of uncertainty, we're sort of past the state of the art in terms of where uh, artificial intelligence is. Imagine doing this in a military decision-making uh, scenario or any real world where now you've got physics at play, uh, you've got uh, multi, multiple agents and, and heterogeneous uh, actors of all different kinds. And so uh, uncertainty really complicates things in a way that puts us kind of past the frontier uh, of where artificial intelligence is today. The last point I want to make is that intelligence is contextual. All right. So we've observed a couple of use cases, uh, starting with Johnny's, right? So artificial intelligence is not a monolith. It's really about empowering people um, in certain contexts and applications to, 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 um, to, to do what they're trying to do. And in the case of Johnny, we've seen that with the prosthetic. In the case of uh, the engineers outside of the scene uh, commanding the marsupial robotic uh, team, uh, marsupial robot team I talked about before, there's a certain context, a certain kind of application, a certain workflow for people, a level of complexity. And now let's look at a new example. So this is from space exploration. So APL does national security, uh, health and space exploration. And so this uh, image was taken by uh, or captured by the New Horizon spacecraft billions of miles from Earth after a 10 year trip, you know, from Earth to, to, um, to within a few thousand miles of Pluto. And even then, uh, there's a context for operation. There's a human machine team and a workflow. There's space scientists and engineers uh, on, uh, on the ground that need to be able to, to maintain some shared situational awareness, et cetera. And so there's a context for the capabilities we're trying to enable in these systems. And 
one of the places that we struggle with now is really understanding um, context is such a dynamic thing, uh, how you put limits on, on when on that context and when a system uh, really would be competent in, in being able to carry out a task autonomously. Um, does it work well in the day and the night? This kind of semantic uh, notion of context is more like how we think as human beings. Uh, but these are really complex statistical uh, phenomena for machines. And, and so we really need to advance the science of how we understand context and understand the competency of, of systems in context. And that's true uh, across the board for where we're, we're trying to go with artificial intelligence. Okay, so, so these are the three points that I've made and a little bit of a way forward for each one. So intelligent systems empower people. We really need to double down on this notion. Um, there really is no such thing as a fully autonomous system. We need to understand uh, the roles that people play from the design of a system to the operation of a system and beyond um, and really try to center the technology lifestyle around the uh, life cycle around the roles that people play. Uncertainty is hard for humans and machines. And so we really need to, to dig into this as well. Um, first, acknowledging uh, that, that you know, the world is an uncertain place. Um, decisions are made in that context and advance our ability to make optimal decisions under uncertainty and better understand the role of machines in helping us do that. And finally, intelligence is contextual. And so from here, um, we really need to advance our ability to appropriate, appropriately calibrate trust in a system, a human's mental model, a commander or an operator's mental model of a system, how it will perform under certain conditions to better, um, you know, to, 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 to better uh, our ability to delegate to machines appropriately given context. If we over trust, we may delegate at a, at a, uh, a time that's inappropriate or in a context that's inappropriate. If we under trust, we may fail to realize the value of these systems um, in the variety of applications that, that where they could add value. Okay, so, so these are the three points. I hope they're adding something to today's discussion. And I'm really looking forward to um, the ensuing discussion and question and answer period. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you, Ashley, for that uh, presentation. And um, and now it, our next speaker is Eben Eve, who's an assistant professor at the Danish National Defense College, Institute for Military Technology. She's the head of the newly established Center for Operational Law. Eben's research has focused on the legal aspects of new technology and methods of warfare with a focus on artificial intelligence and autonomous weapons. In addition to being an academic, Eben is a practitioner and has combined her academic background with extensive operational legal experience, including three operational deployments. Even if you would turn on your camera, we will turn it over to you for the legal perspective. Thank you very much. Um, so let me begin by joining Ashley in thanking the U.S. Naval War College Stockton Center for hosting this important discussion. I am very honored to be part of this. Um, and also big thanks to Ashley for his extremely interesting and not least useful perspectives on intelligent systems. I don't think we could have hoped for a better platform to begin our examination and discussion of the legal implications of AI and weapon systems from. But before I try to connect as less more technical points with a uh, legal perspectives, there's a few things that I would like to make clear from the beginning to avoid basic misunderstandings. Um, First, as most of you are probably aware of, um, the law of armed conflict does not contain any explicit prohibition of lethal autonomous weapon systems or AI enabled weapon system. And nor is there any explicit requirement that the various decisions required to comply with the rules on distinction, proportionality and precautions in attack are made by human beings. This means simply that laws are not Laws, lethal autonomous weapon systems are not prohibited per se, nor is machine decision making. Um, now that we have that in place, I will move on to, um, to the first point that Ashley made today, namely um, about the um, system approach or the human machine teams approach um, to weapon systems, autonomous weapon systems. Um, I think that this is an extremely important point to keep in mind at all times uh, because 
it means that, as Ashley points out, there is no such thing as fully autonomous systems um, when there's always a human uh, part of the system, a human that is involved in the operation of the system at some point, whether or not it is before or after the activation of the system. In my opinion, therefore, it's fair to dismiss the notion of a fully autonomous weapon systems put forward by different actors, um, part of the campaign to stop killer robots, who have, say, continuously presented the idea of systems beyond any form of human control, which are capable of selecting and engaging targets based on very broad and overall mission statements and beyond any type of human control. Also, it's important because having dismissed this idea, um, we can uh, we can frame uh, laws differently uh, in the legal context. So that rather than thinking about whether or not an autonomous weapon is capable of complying with LOEC itself, we should ask whether or not the use of the system in question i.e. the operator and the weapon together, is capable of complying with the fundamental rules of the law of armed conflict. And why is that important? Well, it's important because it allows us to change focus away from a very narrow understanding of the, or and focus on the technical properties of the weapon systems to a more comprehensive analysis of what the weapon can do in combination with a human operator who understands context and is capable of exercising the judgment that is necessary for many of the qualitative tasks required by, by the law of armed conflict. Furthermore, the human machine teaming approach may have important implications for the approach to how we conduct legal reviews of new weapons, where it may begin to make more sense to assess the capabilities of the human machine team, the combination of the weapon itself and the human operator, rather than a narrow assessment of whether the use of the weapon as such will, in some or all circumstances, breach the rules of additional protocol one or any other rule of international law to which the state developing the system in question is party. All right, in relation to Ashley's second point about uncertainty being difficult for machine learned algorithms to handle, one might simply say that this is a problem because military operations are indeed characterized by complexity and uncertainties. This is not least because of the dynamic nature of modern battle space that is characterized also by enemies who do not always play by the rules. So doubt seems to be an inherent feature in armed conflicts and thereby also a factor that military planners constantly have to deal with in their operational planning. Ashley's chess example showed us how much complex machine decision making becomes when the operational environment is itself complex and full of uncertainties. But what does the law of armed conflict have to say about uncertainty? Well, although there is no explicit requirement in the law of armed conflict that military commander making decisions about attacks must eliminate all uncertainties before launching an attack, um, the law of armed conflict does deal with uncertainties in two different ways. First, it, that it sets, for, sets forth precautionary rules that require that those who decide or carry out attacks must do everything feasible to verify the status of the object and the expected collateral damage um, and to limit um, collateral damage through the choice of weapons and tactics. Importantly, uh, these obligations are ongoing and Article 57 of Addi Additional Protocol 1 further requires that attacks um, must be cancelled or suspended if new information, uh, including information that becomes available after the weapon system has been activated, reveals that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the target is no longer a military objective or that the amount of expected collateral damage turns out to be excessive to the anticipated military advantage. This means that in, case, in cases where we found that, find out that circumstances on the ground are different from what we thought they would be, we have a duty to act either to adjust our, uh, our plans for the attack or to suspend it or cancel it. Um, the other way in which the law of armed conflict deals with uncertainties is that 
It sets forward um, a presumption of civilian status um, of persons and civilian use of objects in cases of doubt, meaning that if we cannot verify verify to the extent necessary um, beyond reasonable doubt that that a person is a, a is a combatant or a civilian taking direct part in hostility or if a an object is actually um, a military objective due to its use well then we have to refrain from attacking so Although uncertainties must be accepted in the operational planning, we have to be able to adjust our plans. And if there is doubt about um, the status of the object or the person we're going to attack, and that doubt uh, cannot be um, solved by uh, requiring additional verification, well, then we have to, um, to abstain from attacking. So, um, if the weapon system we use are based on algorithms that are incapable of dealing with uncertainties or deviation from normal uh, circumstances, my argument is that the above mentioned rules must be respected through the inclusion of human judgment when necessary. And that can either be done by keeping a human being in the decision making loop after um, even after the system has been, uh, been uh, activated uh, in order to ensure that the variations from the baseline scenario on which the planning of the operation is uh, based, um, that uh, they can be handled properly um, to ensure that, um, that the above mentioned rules are respected. Another way of, um, of handling uncertainties is to restrict the use of weapon systems with autonomous attack capabilities down to the point where doubt and uncertainties are effectively eliminated. And that can, for example, be, for example, be done by defining extremely restrictive attack parameters, for example, by limiting targets of the systems to those that appear on a list of pre-approved targets and requiring that objects can only be attacked if there's 100% match between a tracked object and a pre-approved target uh, in the system's target database. One could further restrict attacks to situations in um, pre-specified geographical areas and prohibit, prohibit attacks where human beings and civilian objects are in danger of being killed or destroyed. This way, the need to conduct proportionality assessment and ask for guidance from a human operator can actually be avoided. Um, and uncertainties be handled in a rather safe manner. However, this way of tailoring the operation in a very restrictive manner in order to create a structured environment in which the system can function in compliance with law of armed conflict will obviously also limit uh, the ways in which the system can be used and thereby render it useless in a number of other situations. Um, and it will be difficult to figure out exactly when we can trust the system and when we cannot. Um, one might argue that intelligence systems lack of ability to handle uncertainties makes them unpredictable, which may or may not be the case. But whether or not a system is sufficiently predictable and reliable must in such situations be established through extensive texting, testing prior to fielding. Um, where the systems um, performance can be observed um, and its actions um, can be observed and evaluated numerous times and thereby give us a realistic impression of how the system acts in a number of different situations. However, testing is complex, not least when we're dealing with such AI-based autonomous systems. Um, and we don't have any internationally uh, agreed standards for how predictable or how reliable systems must be. So that will have to be, uh, be settled um, by each state conducting this testing. Um, and then finally, I'll try to make it short. Um, about uh, the last of Ashley's points, um, that intelligence is context specific. Um, well, that is indeed also something that has implications for a system's ability to be used in compliance with the law of armed conflict. The main challenge is, as Ashley pointed out, that context is dynamic and at the same time, correct application of the targeting rules in the law of armed conflict depends on the particular context ruling at the time of the decision being made. 
Now, this means that a weapon systems need to uh, make decisions based on the current situations as it is. And if it's different from the normal operational context of the system, it will have to take into consideration the change context in its decision making in order to reach a correct decision. And if it's not possible for the system to uh, part from the original context and adjust to a new one, uh, we have a problem. Um, and this problem is further complicated by another aspect of context, namely that tasks such as distinction between civilians and combatants or persons DPHing and proportionality assessments requires a good portion of understanding of the context in which the attack taking place. So a reasonable commander will almost always have to ask himself why a situation has occurred. For example, why a person who appears to be a civilian, because he's wearing civilian clothes and he's not within military premises, um, is actually carrying arms uh, in that situation. Um, that could happen for a number of reasons and without questioning. Um, the situation, it will be difficult in some, in some cases to actually uh, interpret the situation correctly. And Ashley pointed out to us that machine learning algorithms are not capable of reasoning um, and exercising judgment um, about, um, about the patterns they're recognizing. So for as long as machines are incapable of um, handling tasks that require context specific reasoning without human assistance and intelligent systems should only be used with in the narrow parameters of the context in which it has been trained to work and again before fielding we have to put a lot of effort into testing and evaluating the acts of the system in order to be able to trust that it can actually be used in compliance with the law of armed conflict and i think i will stop here Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Eben. If um, you and Ashley could both turn on your cameras and microphones, we'll um, get started with our questions. And thank you both for such uh, great uh, presentations. Um, certainly what I'd like to do now is I'm going to you know, exercise my prerogative as the moderator to sort of ask the first question. And it's going to follow on with what Eben had talked about. As intelligence and intelligent and autonomous systems come into development and use, you know, it is clear that I think that testing is going to play an important role. This is certainly something that I, as the Army representative that conducts weapons reviews, am, am very concerned about as we go through this. Um, you know, how do we, DOD has recognized in, in a recent report authored by um, Michelle Flournoy and others that testing within the Department of Defense needs to change. Um, and there's but there's not a lot of clarity on what that uh, entails. And certainly we've gotten questions, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, roll in Peter Margulies question. He had asked, and I think this, Ashley, we'll start with you, is, is um, bias in the data that goes in there. He was talking about bias in training data. So as we start doing testing, you know, how do you account for this? And, and what do you see as the, the way to test for these intelligent type systems? They're that, that certainly gonna be much different than, you know, testing for a, um, a firearm or, or other just sort of standard type weapon. Yeah, thanks for the question. Maybe I'll just make two quick points about testing and then come back to this notion of <clears throat> uh, biased data. So one of the things, uh, you know, the points that, it, one of the key themes I think in the, in the remarks is this notion of human centered uh, view of intelligent systems. And so I would advocate for a human-centered view of test and evaluation as well. Certainly, we need to do some rigorous kind of component level testing, uh, testing of the system. But ultimately, what we care about, I think, is the ability of some human and machine or some group of humans and group of machines to perform the mission. Uh, and I think what we're really testing at the end of the day is that team and that mental model that the person has, because that complex notion of context what really matters is that that person that's exercising the judgment on when to allocate a task or, or designate a task to the system does so appropriately. So, so I would advocate for that. I, I also um, want to just emphasize the role of simulation in testing. Um, having been part of some real world tests uh, for, for the Navy, for, for different kinds of systems, it's expensive to say be out on the ocean testing a system. Uh, and you're only ever going to do so many trials, so many runs. 
And so we're going to be relying more and more heavily on kind of a joint simulation and reality testing. And so we need to get a lot better at understanding what you can learn from large scale simulation, how that should inform how you do real world and how you use those artifacts together to, to um, develop assurance uh, cases or assurance arguments around the system. And then finally, bias in the data. So let me just say that I do take a statistician's view of bias. Uh, bias is not, in my view, inherently good or bad. The question is, is, is a certain bias useful for a particular decision and appropriate, or is it not? Um, you know, my computer vision algorithm may be uh, biased towards conditions in urban areas versus rural areas. And if I'm only ever going to use it in, in urban areas, then maybe that bias is okay. Uh, so I think we need to kind of stick, take a step back and understand that, um, you know, biases, we need to be able to start to capture them a little bit more. Are these biases appropriate for the context? And then are they consistent with our values? And so there may be cases where the data tell a certain story and you want to bias the data in a way that better reflects our values because the data is what it is, but, you know, it reflects conditions that, um, you know, are in society today, but do not reflect our aspirations for society. So um, anyway, <laughs> we don't have much time. Those are fairly high level answers. Happy to get more into whatever uh, as we have time. Eben, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I really agree with what Ashley said there specifically about, you know, whether or not the bias is consistent with with our values. Uh, we have to look at also the uh, discrimination. Is there anything in the data bias that could lead to uh, unlawful discrimination from a lawyer's perspective? Um, in relation to testing, I, I mean, I think that that is one of the most interesting and challenging uh, aspects of um, of such systems and you know how do we conduct legal reviews um, whether under customary international law or article 36 and I would um, I mean what what I'm trying to do is to start a dialogue with our industry uh, in Denmark where I come from you know industry and state is not very closely connected so there's no no collaboration necessarily uh, until um, the product is actually uh, presented to the state that means that that you could in theory have have a have a weapon that hasn't been subject subjected to any sort of legal considerations um at least not the law of armed conflict before it's actually presented to the customer uh, to the customer and i would very much like the industry to to work with us to work with lawyers from the beginning and to talk to our people who are in charge of acquisitions in order to help them uh, specify the requirements that are raised by, by legal concerns from the beginning so that it's not something that the Danish state has to uh, start looking at afterwards. And furthermore, when testing is done by the industry itself, it would be useful to include military personnel and legal uh, lawyers um, from the military already that early in the state so that we make a smarter testing process rather than having two different processes, one uh, the sort of industry testing and the other the legal review conducted by the state. Thank you. Um, uh, the next question stays on sort of the testing and I'm com going to combine I think a couple of questions that we have. The first one from Alec and then Eric Jensen. Uh, so I'm going to start with Alec. Alec's question um, is for the panel was, I guess, starting with you, Ashley, is, you know, now sort of existing system certifications are predicated on kind of a predictable system behavior. Given the increased on levels of uncertainty in AI systems that you've talked about, what do you see as a credible basis for having a certification for this type of particular system if it's unpredictable? And then I'm going to roll Eric's question into that as well. And he said, with respect to uncertainty, uh, he wants to, I guess, understand, you say uncertainty with machine, machine decision making is tied to the large number of options available rather than some sort of inability to come to a decision based on the amount or the clarity of the data. I, I think Eric just wants to make sure he understood that correctly. Um, and if, if it is, if it seems to be different than the way we use uncertainty with respect to human decisions, do machines perceive uncertainty because they don't have sufficient data or they generally come to conclusion based on the data they have and decided a certain percentage of certainty? Um, so in other words, he says, does uncertainty because lack of data or machine causes a machine not to take an action or is it a programmable type issue? 
Okay, great questions, a lot there. Um, I'm gonna to attempt to, to address the, the, the major points there. So um, let me just say that a certain degree of unpredictability in an AI system is kind of the point. Uh, if we knew exactly what we wanted the system to do in every single case and we could enumerate that, um, if you can do that, you should do that. You should write tens of thousands of lines of code that tell the system exactly what to do in every circumstance. And so the idea that the system would be able to have, um, be, be able to take in situations that you hadn't quite been able to enumerate because they were uh, complex or because um, you know there's just too many, uh, kind of a state-space explosion, and still deal with that in a reasonable way, but in a way that you couldn't predict in advance. That's kind of what we want out of AI system. And so I do think um, to get that value proposition, I think we're going to have to move maybe uh, slightly away from do I know what it will do in every circumstance to do I know how it will perform uh, in aggregate while being able to bound um, the unintended consequences. So if I can bound the, the, the system so that, you know, I can limit the unintended consequences and I'm satisfied with uncertainty within a certain box, but knowing that if I run the experiment enough times in aggregate, I'll see a certain level of performance. And that level of performance is worth the risk because, you know, if a human was to do it, maybe there would be, you know, a, a lesser level of performance running the experiment a lot of times. And so um, that would be my comment to there. Not, not anything too precise, but, but moving in the direction of, of taking a more statistical view on what we mean by predictable and performance view. Um, and then in terms of uncertainty, let me just say that there's many different sources of uncertainty. So what I didn't mean to convey that, uh, you know, the kind of uh, state space uncertainty that I talked about was the only kind of uncertainty. Uh, but certainly uh, that uh, is, is a predominant, you know, is, is not a predominant, but, but an important form. So let me just say another kind of thing that's hard in a, in a system design, but that is desirable, is you would like the system to be able to say, I don't know when appropriate. You would like the system to be able to abstain from taking an action when there is too much uncertainty or when it's in a situation that's not competent. Um, and this can be very difficult, but it's something we want to get to. So, you know, what, what might be a source of uncertainty? So um, let's say we, we have a little video that we use as a, as a stimulation for research where someone walks behind an occlusion in a scene and trades, uh, is, is carrying a football, walks behind a pole, and then is carrying a Frisbee. And so, you know, the system doesn't know where the football is anymore. So there's some uncertainty. The system may have some hypotheses uh, and then may try to take action. Maybe the system is going to move around the pole to see um, you know, what, what might have been left there or something like that. So many different kinds of sources of uncertainty. You'd like the system to be able to know when it's missing information, maybe eventually act, you know, sense or something to be able to manage that uncertainty. Um, so I'm not sure if I quite answered the question, but uh, hopefully I offered uh, some relevant thoughts there. Great. Thank you, Ashley. And even I got a um, question for you, and I guess, uh, and it's going to hopefully tie in a couple of the other parts of questions we have. If we, as we move forward with artificial intelligence, you know, I guess for me, the question is, where is the role for the lawyer in, in targeting? For example, we see that DOD is working on project convergence. Um, and I know there's going to be a panel, panel of four on futures command. So we're not going to talk too much on this, but you know, again, project convergence is defined, it's a sign for the battlefield of the future that connects sensors on the battlefield to the right command and control nodes that allows commanders and operators to see, understand, decide, and then act quicker than their adversaries. Certainly this is an oversimplification, but even as we see the sort of the decision process shrink to seconds, how do we ensure that the LOAC principles that have to be applied to targeting get considered? So simply, where, where do you see the role of the lawyer in this process? Well, I think that the role of the lawyer will become much more front-loaded. A lot more will happen before the activation of the system and uh, the actual conduct of, um, of the attack. Um, I already mentioned that I, that I think uh, lawyers will have to play a role in formulating the requirements. Um, that are uh, used um, to um, to specify the needs um, of the Danish defense, at least. So, so we we will we will have to um, we will have to uh, 
assist uh, the technical and military staff in, in formulating what is it that these systems will have to be capable of. Um, we will play an important role in, um, in the legal review of the system as well. Um, and then, as we already discussed, um, at least in the foreseeable future, there's a lot of decisions that, um, that machines and computers probably will not be capable of making um, correctly, especially those that require um, judgment um, and uh, understanding of the context, reasoning of the context. And therefore, um, I still believe that that we will see human beings in, um, in a supervisory role, at least. And obviously, speed um, makes it more difficult for humans to reach uh, decisions um, and go through the different analyses that are normally required um, by the law of armed conflict. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't have to be made, that th those decisions can be disregarded. Obviously, time affects uh, what can be uh, expected, what is feasible in a given situation. But, but if we cannot do it within the short time frame um, just before an attack is carried out, we have to ensure that the parameters, the attack parameters for the system, the mission specific programming that in my opinion needs to happen before the activation of any system that sets out the parameters for that particular use of the system, that they reflect correctly um, the uh, rules and principles of the law of armed conflict but much more front-loaded than, than what we're actually seeing now because a lot is gonna happen very, very fast. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna, this ties in, I think about three of four of the questions that have been asked in, in sort of different formats. Um, but, but one of them, you know, essentially it boils down to, you know, at the time that we were formulating the rules for the law of armed conflict, you know, the idea of autonomous weapons and artificial intelligence weren't really thought of. Um, Due to limitations on imagination. Uh, so the question becomes, you know, do we think this is time, the right time now to develop sort of universally agreeable low act provisions that pertain to autonomous systems and um, uh, artificial intelligence? So I think even that's probably over to you first. Well, I, I don't see a, a need to develop any low act specific provisions. Um, or any, sorry, uh, specific, um, or, uh, any autonomous weapon specific provisions um, in, in LOEC, at least not in hard law form, um, in treaty form. I think that what we need to start looking at is, you know, how are we, how are we, how are we going to ensure um, that the operator and the system um, will be used in a way that can comply with uh, the rules of LOAC at the tactical level. So get more practical, start looking at how do we set up uh, command and control systems? How do we, uh, how, is there any need for, um, for uh, directives or maybe even rules of engagement um, regulation there that, you know, that could apply specifically to uh, to autonomous systems and AI based systems but I don't think I don't think that there's a need to to write up new um, treaty rules um, on on how to um, how to how, how these systems can be used but I think it's a national cooperation on the development on on standards and on, on a operational concepts for those systems could be really helpful Great. And then Ashley, uh, we've only got a couple minutes, so I'm going to finish off with a, a question for you. And, and we've sort of touched on this. You, you, you talked from a sort of a technician's perspective. And again, as a lawyer and, and one who does, conducts weapons reviews, how do we get lawyers and technicians and those, all of those that are involved in this process that need to be involved in this process for artificial intelligence and weapon systems? How do we get to where we can start talking the same language and, and how much do... I, as a lawyer, need to understand about the technology and how much do you, as the technician, need to understand about the law? It's a, it's a fantastic question. And I think the, the only real, or at least the, uh, I really like Eben's comments about front-loading the role of the lawyer and, and making this a lot more of a collaborative exercise. I think folks in my profession, uh, technologists, we can learn a lot from lawyers about human decision-making and human judgment and be, maybe be even looking forward to 
outcomes of human decisions and how those will be analyzed and taking all that into account during design. Uh, I have colleagues that are from legal backgrounds at the laboratory and we engage uh, around some of these, you know, maybe not to the extent that even envisions. And I think we do need to move more in that direction, but we're starting to have those conversations. We're talking about computer vision algorithms, uh, decision-making algorithms, uncertainty, and all of that. So um, I, I really like the direction of it becoming more and more collaborative. And by the way, not just technologists and, and lawyers, but, you know, probably uh, even a broader cross-section of, uh, you know, professional backgrounds and stakeholders throughout the technology lifecycle. Great. Uh, I'm afraid it's three o'clock, at least according to my clock. So I want to say a great thanks to Ashley and Eben for participating in this panel. Um, sorry we don't have additional time, but uh, John, I will turn it back over to you. And thanks so much uh, for both of you. Thanks a lot. Mike, thanks very much uh, for, for the moderation of that panel and, and to both of our panelists. Thank you. And, and even uh, special thanks to you for doing this so late at night from Denmark. Uh, it's, it's hard enough to talk about these issues uh, in the daytime, let alone do it uh, well past the dinner hour. Uh, so we're going to take a break right now, and then we will re-engage at 310, 15, 10 military time uh, to talk about potential accountability gaps. So we will see you all in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back, and, and thank you again for joining us. Uh, our last panel was fantastic, of course, uh, and, and they talked about you know, capabilities and the impact of those capabilities and technologies on the law of armed conflict. And our next panel is going to talk about you know, responsibility or accountability with regard to those technologies in the law. Uh, this panel is sponsored, co-sponsored by the Paul Tsai China Center at the Law School and their executive director, Robert Williams, is our moderator. So I'll turn to you, Robert, take it away. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Cherry. And uh, thank you to the Stockton Center uh, for putting together this terrific discussion. Um, on behalf of the Yale Law School Paul Tsai China Center, just wanna underscore how delighted we are to be uh, co-sponsoring this event with you today. Uh, that last session on AI and the law of armed conflict, I think segues very nicely into this one. Uh, the topic of, of this panel, as you indicated, is, is there an accountability gap in lethal autonomous weapons systems? Now, I think we can see already, uh, just uh, <laughs> based on that title uh, and, and in light of the discussions we've had so far today, that the terminology here can be particularly tricky uh, when, when we're talking about autonomous or, or AI-enabled systems, uh, and that questions of legal uh, and other forms of accountability are themselves hotly contested. Uh, fortunately, to help us sort through these issues, uh, we have two very distinguished panelists with us. Uh, beginning with uh, Laura Dickinson, who's the Oswald Simister Colclo Research Professor and Professor of Law at George Washington University. She's also formerly a special counsel to the General Counsel at the U.S. Department of Defense uh, and a senior policy advisor in the State Department. Uh, so we'll begin with uh, Laura's recorded presentation. Thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this terrific conference. My topic today is the accountability challenge posed by lethal autonomous weapon systems, often called laws. My view is that there is a real challenge, but I believe we are overly focused in thinking about accountability only in criminal terms. The problem with such a focus is that many of the harms that could arise from such systems are not intentional and criminal liability is ill-suited to address unintentional harms. I think there is promise for another type of accountability that already exists but has received too little attention, what I have termed administrative accountability. So first, I will briefly examine the types of harms likely to arise from the use of laws. Second, 
I will discuss the state of the current debate about accountability for laws, including the focus on criminal responsibility and the problems with this focus. And while an alternative civil tort-like approach is theoretically possible, there are few, if any, existing venues for such accountability. So third, I will discuss what I think is the promise of administrative accountability. I'll explore some of the different forms of administrative accountability and propose reforms to improve transparency, independence, and impartiality of administrative accountability mechanisms. So what are the types of situations that might give rise to a need for accountability? This morning, we heard about many new military technologies and the prospect for the use of increasingly autonomous systems. In this area, it is important to distinguish fact from fiction and to organize our discussion around realistic development of such systems rather than fever dreams. But it is undeniable that the capability of autonomous systems is increasing. And here I am using the definition of autonomy to mean the capacity to select among targets. In order to understand the kinds of accountability challenges that autonomous systems pose, we need to understand the kind of harms they pose. A lot of harms that could arise are not intended by any human. Rather, they tend to arise from organizational systems and a human-machine interaction in which the machine could fail and slip out of effective human control. Paul Scharr, who spoke this morning, has suggested that the risk factors of such systems include the inherent hazard of a system, such as the task being performed and the operational environment, with lethal systems operating in dense urban environments being the riskiest. The time between failure and possibility of corrective human action. The complexity of the system. Risks from adversaries such as hacking. And risks of unpredictability of systems that are not rule based, but rather engage in so called machine learning by evaluating large data sets. Now, an example of such a failure is illustrative. Two US Patriot Air Defense System friendly fire or fratricide incidents during the 2003 invasion of Iraq. In one incident, a US Patriot battery shot down a British aircraft, killing the crew when the Patriot's automation misidentified the aircraft as an anti-radiation missile and a separate system allowing friendly military aircraft to identify themselves also failed. Yet these two factors alone were not enough to cause the fratricide. The Patriot was operating in semi-autonomous mode and required human approval. But the human operator also made a mistake by accepting the Patriot's incorrect identification. No one intended for the harms to occur. Rather, it was the human machine interaction in the complex system that caused the problem. As Shar has pointed out, the complexity of the system contributed to human operators misperceiving or misunderstanding the system's behavior, in some cases, taking inappropriate actions. So what is the current state of the accountability debate? What happens when an autonomous weapon system, in particular, a system equipped to use lethal force, gets it wrong? In other words, what happens when a system runs amok and either targets civilians or kills civilians indiscriminately or disproportionately? When soldiers commit egregious violations of the law of armed conflict, we have established systems for holding them criminally responsible. Many scholars and policymakers have argued that it would be hard to hold humans responsible for harms involving laws within our current civilian and military criminal justice systems. 
This is because increasingly autonomous systems raise the specter of unintentional harms. That is failures that are not intended by the human operators either in or on the loop. But the current criminal law framework is not well suited for unintentional harms. Another problem is that a lot of the harms stem from the overall organizational system, the interaction of its components, and the interaction of humans and machines within that system. And yet criminal law has not been very successful in dealing with organizational harms. Adapting criminal law to these situations would require significant changes, such as relaxing the intent requirement or expanding doctrines such as command responsibility or imposing organizational responsibility, which could work in some situations, but which would carry significant problems. At bottom, if we are going to criminally punish individuals for harms they did not intend, we risk undermining core criminal law principles. For example, such accountability could violate longstanding fundamental due process rights by taking away individual liberty for un unintentional wrongs. Others have argued that an enhanced tort law framework for civil liability at the international level could fill the gap. They argue that when there is no intentional harm, the accountability goal of deterrence rather than punishment or retribution should be primary. And that that gap can be better filled through tort law. And tort law is quite well equipped to cover situations involving negligence or even strict liability. But there are few existing venues in which to pursue this option. So when we are facing the potential for unintentional harms and human machine interaction in complex organizational systems, what I am calling administrative accountability could be a better fit than criminal responsibility. To be sure, if there is intentional wrongdoing on the part of a human, then criminal responsibility would be entirely appropriate. But rather than tinkering with criminal doctrines, we may be better served in many situations to invoke mechanisms of what I am terming administrative accountability. And these mechanisms have the virtue of already existing, although they certainly could be improved upon. By administrative accountability, I am referring to existing mechanisms, both military and civilian, that are often used for accidents and other types of problems. Their goal is not individual punishment, although they can involve financial and other penalties for individuals, such as loss of rank. But they can also be broader in their remedial scope. For example, leading to monetary payments to those who have been harmed. They can also be forward-looking, focusing on organizational reforms for the future. And because they are not taking away individuals' liberty, they can be much more flexible in their procedures. In the United States, examples include commander's inquiries, fact-finding investigations pursuant to Army Regulation 15-6, advisory committee task forces, and agency inspector general inquiries, among others. Other countries such as the United Kingdom, Australia, and others have comparable procedures. I believe they hold real promise for addressing harms caused by autonomous systems. Because they do not lead to criminal penalties, they do not carry the intent problem of criminal law. And sanctions can be imposed for negligent behavior or even in strict liability circumstances. Unlike tort mechanisms for international law, for which there are limited venues, they already exist. They can include recommendation for prospective and organizational reforms or changes and they can be quite flexible in their procedures. Now, I do not want to suggest that they are necessarily a panacea. Certainly,
because they are largely within the executive branch, guarantees of independence, impartiality, and transparency are critical, and reforms may be needed to better protect these values. For example, some experts such as Eugene Fidel have criticized the 15-6 process for its lack of transparency. And certainly there are some situations in which the independence and impartiality of these administrative accountability systems could improve as well. And with respect to civilian options, for example, more work could be done to protect inspectors general. I think an important future work could look at how to safeguard these values in administrative processes. But the bottom line is that they are critical accountability tools that may be particularly well suited to the harms caused by laws. And they deserve to be included in the accountability debate moving forward. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you so much to Professor Dickinson. Uh, and we'll now turn to our next panelist who uh, is Professor Li Chiang, uh, an associate professor of law and the director of the Military Law Institute at the China University of Political Science and Law. He's also deputy secretary general of the Beijing Military Law Society uh, and a member of an expert panel on lawfare for the Chinese PLA Air Force. Um, also, uh, Happy to say, uh, recently a visiting scholar at uh, our Paul Tsai China Center at Yale. So, uh, Professor Lee, uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chiang Li. I come from Military Law Institute of China University of Political Science and Law. Uh, it's my great honor to be invited to attend such great event organized by Naval War College. In this session, we are talking about the issue of accountability for the misuse of the lethal autonomous weapon systems. At the beginning, uh, I would like to set a limit uh, on the scope of my presentation. I will mainly focus on the misuse of the autonomous weapon systems in the context of armed conflict, which means the misuse of such weapon systems in peacetime, for example, uh, in law enforcement operations or in the context of use at bellum is not included. I also mainly focus on the accountability at international level rather than domestic level, because the latter might be varied in different countries. Uh, that would make this issue more complicated and I won't do that in this presentation. But at the end, uh, I'll talk uh, a little bit about the case in China. At the international level, uh, especially in the context of use in bail law, the accountability has two forms, state responsibility and uh, individual criminal responsibility. So is there any accountability gap uh, in the lethal autonomous weapon systems? The answers might be different uh, in different situations. As for state responsibility, uh, undoubtedly, states shall be, uh, shall be only responsible for international wrongful acts, which could be attributed to them. Uh, in such a situation, if the armed forces employed the autonomous weapon systems uh, in wartime, from my, uh, from my perspective, uh, the state which they belong to shall be responsible. Basically, there is no accountability gap in such a situation. The first additional protocol one uh, of 1977 establishes a very strict responsibility for its state parties. States shall be responsible for all acts committed by persons forming part of its armed forces. Even if the wrongful acts perpetrated by the uh, autonomous weapon systems themselves they were deployed and employed by the armed forces as weapons. So those acts should and shall be regarded as committed by members of armed forces, regardless of their intent. Unlike individual criminal responsibility, intent has never been a constitutive element 
of state responsibility. This rule should also apply to the state, not a party to the additional protocol one, such as the United States, because the 1907, the Hague Convention uh, 4, and the 1949 Geneva Conventions contain the similar provisions. And they are believed to become a customary international law. But international humanitarian law is not a self-contained body of law. It only deals with the one aspect of this issue. If we refer to the articles on state responsibility of 2001 uh, made by uh, International Law Commission, the other cases might be also relevant, including but not limit to the acts of persons, of entities exercising elements of governmental authority. For example, those acts committed by private military and security companies. The acts of a person or group uh, directed or controlled by state, for example, those acts committed by uh, non-state armed groups. The acts carried out in absence or default of the official authorities, such as the Levy MSC, and the acts acknowledged and adopted by a state as its own. I'll take the first one as an, exa uh, as an example. Uh, unlike armed forces as a state organ, in this case, it requires the person or entity exercising elements of governmental authority is acting in that capacity in the particular instance. If such a person or group is acting in that capacity, when activating an autonomous weapon system, but disqualified soon after, and that weapon is still in function. It seems to be difficult to say the state shall uh, they belong to shall be responsible uh, indisputably for those wrongful acts uh, committed by that weapon. I didn't say it's not possible for accountability in such a situation, but uh, in fact, the accountability, uh, the, uh, the accountability gap uh, might exist. In other cases I mentioned here, I think the things are very similar. As for individual criminal responsibility, in the most cases, the accountability uh, gap exists indeed. It is a well-established rule that individuals who committed war crimes self uh, shall be responsible for those serious offenses. Logically, no matter what crimes uh, were committed through weapons or weapon systems, with or without human control, there is no substantive uh, difference uh, in the uh, legal con uh, in the legal consequences. But actually, if the human judgment were replaced by algorithm it would be very challenging for accountability. The use of uh, autonomous weapon systems will break the mode of liability centralized by human operators and commanders. But the modern criminal justice systems uh, only focus on humans rather than machines. Now we have two options. The first one is the, the autonomous weapon systems should be regarded as uh, fictitious persons and responsible for war crimes committed by them. This option has been objected by many scholars and experts. The second one is the real humans will be responsible because uh, the autonom autonomous weapon systems are always some kind of weapons regardless how intelligent uh, they are. In such, uh, in such a situation, many people related to autonomous, uh, autonomous weapon systems might be involved, uh, including designers, programmers, uh, manufacturers, and the end users. If we want them to be responsible for illegal acts committed by autonomous weapon systems, 
without any uh, human intervention. The key element is absent. How do we prove that those people, those people have certain intent or awareness for those crimes? To what extent should the human operators and commanders be aware of the circum uh, circumstances in which uh, serious violations of international human humanitarian law will be committed by those weapon systems, we yet have an answer on this issue. But in domestic level, things might be a little bit better. In many countries, the perpetrators could be accountable for crimes by negligence. Uh, it's different from the, the uh, uh, international level. For example, in China, the penal code uh, provides the crime of supplying uh, substandard weapons or equipment or military installations to the armed forces on purpose of uh, negligence, which possibly holds people involved in programming and manufacturing of uh, the autonom autonomous weapon systems accountable. It also provides the crime of uh, causing accidents with weapons and equipment and the crime of changing the use of weapons and equipment without uh, authorization, authorization, which possibly hold the end users accountable. Even those rules are not specific to uh, autonomous weapon systems. It indeed applies to the use of such kind of weapons. Uh, even if it is far from sufficient. So in summary, uh, I would like to say there are more gaps for the accountability uh, of humans when using the autonomous weapon systems. It's not easy to resolve this problem. So my suggestion is uh, more studies, more discussions, and more international cooperation uh, would be necessary. Uh, because of the time limit, I will stop here and thank you very much. Terrific. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, both panelists to turn on their cameras. Uh, there they are. And uh, in <clears throat> typical fashion, uh, I will exercise moderator's prerogative to ask uh, each of you the first question before we open it up to a broader conversation. Um, those presentations were particularly helpful in sort of breaking down the dimensions along which we might assign accountability. Um, so individual versus state uh, accountability, and then domestic versus international rules and mechanisms of accountability. Um, without getting into uh, the details of proposals like Professor Dickinson's, I think very useful ideas about how administrative mechanisms uh, can potentially help to bridge the gap to the extent there is a gap uh, in, in terms of individual accountability. Um, I, I would like to maybe take a step back for a second uh, and try to link up this conversation with the last conversation or, 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 or the previous panel. Um, and specifically, I wanna ask about the idea of sort of uh, taking a kind of human centric mm -hmm. approach uh, to the development and deployment of uh, AI enabled weapons systems. So, you know, accountability, it can mean different things. And, and we often think and talk about ex post accountability, which is to say, after an accident or, or uh, incident has occurred, you know, we look, we look backward and try to assess who uh, or which institutions uh, ought to be held accountable for certain actions taken. But I'm curious if each of you maybe could speak a little bit to your thoughts about how to conceptualize and ideally uh, institutionalize accountability throughout the life cycle of these weapons systems. 
from design to acquisition to deployment and then ultimately target engagement. Do you have thoughts about how we can better ensure and embed accountability mechanisms at all of these stages, not just after uh, a kinetic action has taken place? And before I, before, <laughs> before I turn to each of you for an answer, uh, I, I just want to acknowledge uh, the fact that it is currently four o'clock in the morning uh, in China where Professor Lee is joining us from. So uh, we owe a special debt of gratitude to him for uh, being up in the middle of the night uh, and, and very, very early his time to, uh, to join this important discussion. Uh, so e either of you, uh, whoever would like to take that question first, uh, would be curious to get your thoughts. Uh, I'm happy to do that. Um, uh, it's terrific to be here with everyone. Uh, I think it's a great question because I think when we speak about accountability, uh, oftentimes uh, we're speaking about post hoc accountability, whether it's individual responsibility or some other form of responsibility, but as you point out, um, we can broaden our conception of accountability to include ex ante measures. And um, I think sometimes we can speak about this as managerial accountability, um, and uh, there are other terms for it as well. And so I, I think it is important to include this in the discussion and it links very nicely with the last panel because of course, um, uh, averting harms and providing for this type of accountability can happen before any weapon system is deployed. And I think the key is, in, is interdisciplinary uh, teams. Uh, whether uh, you're looking at the weapons review process or um, earlier at the design process, this is critical, uh, including lawyers, uh, along with technologists uh, and, and other actors as well. Uh, hi, Rob. Uh, it's just okay for me. Uh, I, I think uh, I just need some time to, to make my brain clear. And uh, uh, it's a great question, actually. Uh, it is, it's not easy to answer. Uh, from my perspective, uh, when we talk about the, the accountability uh, for the life circle of the autonomous weapon system, uh, uh, the designers, uh, uh, programmers, manufacturers uh, must be involved uh, in, in this process. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, we need to determine what kind of responsibility uh, they will take uh, if we, we want to 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 uh, uh, want them to be accountable. So. For those natural persons, I, I think the individual criminal responsibility uh, may be the the, the, the the better way to 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 uh, uh, resolve this, this problem. Because, uh, but but actually, uh, in the is existing legal system, uh, no matter at the international level uh, or the domestic level. Uh, it's not difficult to to make them uh, uh, criminally responsible for for those illegal acts made by uh, committed uh, committed by the autonomous weapon systems. It, it's something like uh, the the uh, civil liability uh, for the uh, uh, product quality. Uh, but if we talk about the the uh, equipments, military equipments or weapons. Uh, for example, in China, in the penal code of China, we have some similar, uh, some provisions to, to deal with uh, this problem, but it's not specific to, to this kind of situation. Uh, I think it's just to provide a, a possibility to apply those provisions to resolve this problem. But uh, I don't, I'm not sure uh, it, it will be a, a 
a best way to 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 uh, resolve this problem. So, uh, from my perspective, I I really uh, believe maybe the the state responsibility will be appropriate way, and uh, the criminal responsibility or other. Uh, responsibility, for example, the uh, administrative responsibility will be supplement to to uh, those form of, of responsibility. Rob, and so that is is a nice uh, transition to perhaps press uh, Professor Dickinson a, a bit further on your views about the limits of criminal responsibility. Um, because it seems that perhaps there, there may be some uh, distance between uh, your respective views on this uh, about the utility of the criminal law in terms of a, a vehicle for ensuring that, uh, that there is human responsibility here, right? That we're not, uh, that, that we're taking full and adequate account of legal requirements such as, uh, as, as is pointed out in the audience Q&A here, uh, the requirement under Article Article 87 of Additional Protocol 1 uh, for military commanders to prevent breaches of the law of armed conflict. Um, so under the kind of administrative uh, mechanism that you propose, Professor Dickinson, how would you think about fulfilling or ensuring that obligations like that are adequately um, fulfilled uh, you know, I suppose one could argue that any type of administrative accountability system is simply going to be too limited uh, to impose the uh, requisite incentives necessary to, uh, to fulfill the kind of intent of a legal requirement like that. W what view do you have about that? And are there ways in which... Uh, the idea for administrative accountability that you have in mind can account uh, for uh, the perhaps incentive gap that, uh, that uh, I'm proposing or hypothesizing might exist. Great, thank you. It's a, it's a good question. Um, so first of all, I just wanna emphasize, I'm not suggesting that we should jettison uh, criminal uh, accountability. I think it's a very important part of the law of armed conflict and a very important tool for setting incentives and, uh, but also, you know, imposing punishment where appropriate. Um, I, I think there are tweaks that can be made to uh, criminal doctrines, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, and uh, Peter Margulies, who's a participant, has spoken, for example, and written, for example, about uh, adjusting the doctrine of command responsibility, which itself can incorporate the commander's responsibility. And so, you know, you can make tweaks to the criminal law. Jens Olin has also written about this. Uh, we should focus, he argues, uh, less on intent and more on control. Uh, I do have concerns uh, when we relax the intent requirement so much in a criminal context, because I do think it runs up against very important due process norms. And so, um, I think that some of these other options like administrative accountability should be explored even more than they already are. Um, with respect to administrative accountability, one of the virtues of it is that it is quite flexible uh, in its processes. And so um, ideas about the commander's uh, uh, responsibility can be incorporated into administrative mechanisms in thinking about who should bear responsibility and what the consequences should be. So um, for example, there are uh, individualized penalties available in some administrative accountability mechanisms, just not criminal punishment. Um, those consequences, which are often, um, you know, sort of not acknowledged as, as serious and truly they are less serious than criminal punishment, but they can have serious consequences for individuals, um, uh, financial penalties, loss of rank and so on. Um, but administrative accountability also allows us to address um, 
organizational problems, problems of complex systems, uh, that individual criminal responsibility uh, isn't very good at addressing. Uh, yes, I, I, I do agree uh, that we, 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 we couldn't uh, limit our vision to, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, criminal responsibility only. But uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, when we talk about the violations of uh, international humanitarian law during the armed conflict, we just talk about uh, a, 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 a kind of very serious crimes. So uh, if we just focus, uh, if we... Uh, just put uh, the administrative responsibility or, or something like that uh, uh, into it. I, I don't think it's strong enough to, to uh, surprise uh, the, the violations of, of uh, 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 those in international humanitarian law rules. So uh, that's why I, I just focus on the state responsibility and uh, criminal responsibility, because if there is no such kind of punishment, I, I don't think uh, the obligations will be ensured to, to be uh, implement, implemented by the state or the armed forces. Great, thanks to you both. I you know, one of the questions that I've been curious about in this context, um, and that uh, I think comes out in some of the questions that are being posed in the audience Q and A, uh, has to do. You know, can, can I guess be boiled down to the, the the question of what's really new here, right? So, Professor Ashley Deeks. Uh, re asks, you know, recognizing the fully autonomous weapon systems. Uh, emphasis on fully autonomous weapon systems, uh, have some specific features that partially autonomous weapon systems do not. Are there useful historical precedents that can help us think about this problem? Uh, for example, how did the U.S. deal with the Patriot Air Defense uh, incident that Professor Dickinson mentioned? Are, are there other cases where high-tech weapons have acted unpredictably and produced serious harms? And then uh, also in the Q&A, Captain Bo Watkins uh, asks, isn't this kind of analogous to the situation we have with, with the use of mines? Uh, you know, a mine can detonate without human input. The operator can still be held accountable uh, for certain... Uh, uh, failures or, or actions taken. Uh, so how do each of you think about uh, historical and, uh, uh, and, and legal precedents in this space? Are they useful and, and where do they fall short in your judgment? Uh, I actually, uh, I don't think uh, the fully autonomous weapon system has become real. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's brand new for, uh, for all, of, all of us. And uh, the, uh, the, case, uh, the incident uh, uh, mentioned by, by uh, Prof uh, Professor Dinkson uh, in the previous session, uh, I, I think in that case, it's, uh, it's the fault or mistake made by humans, not the uh, autonomous weapon systems uh, th themselves. So uh, here, if we talk about the, uh, the illegal acts made only by the autonomous weapon systems uh, without any human intervention, so that will be some accountability gap. And uh, I, I, I don't think we have some useful uh, historical precedents. Maybe we, we have to uh, try to think about the new ways to resolve this problem. I, I would just say, I, I think, um, I think that the, the historical analogies are helpful and, um, even if they don't uh, go all the way to providing an answer to this accountability gap. Um, so to take the Patriot uh, missile fratricide incidents that I mentioned, um, 
I think we can draw some some lessons from this. Um, there there were several uh, what I would term administrative accountability mechanisms that were used uh, to deal with this situation. Uh, U.S. Central Command uh, conducted a, a fact-finding investigation. Um, and in that case, the principal uh, investigator, General David Edgington of the Air Force, uh, concluded that um, there were some problems with how the system worked, but that no human, no individual human acted criminally, negligently, or recklessly. Um, and therefore did not recommend uh, individual discipline. Um, and US CENTCOM accepted the recommendations. Um, there was also a separate uh, Defense Science Board uh, task force that found problems in how the system operated and recommended significant changes uh, to how the system work, worked. And uh, another analogy not from uh, autonomous weapon systems includes the, um, the strike in 2015, the mistaken strike uh, on, on the Médecins Sans Frontières uh, hospital in Kunduz by the U.S. Air Force, um, and after which there was an Army 15-6 investigation, which again concluded that, that there were actually, in this case, were uh, individuals who violated the law, if not criminally, um, uh, but the but the biggest issue was um, the cascade of failures within the complex organizational system, and there individuals were disciplined, but not criminally. Um, and in addition, uh, there were significant organizational or systems reforms that were made. And so I think this is a helpful analogy. It may not be a perfect uh, system, um, but where you do not have um, individual uh, intentional harm or even negligent or reckless harm, uh, there are options for other forms of penalties and accountability. That being said, um, many people criticized uh, these inquiries for failing to be sufficiently transparent. Uh, and sufficiently independent. And I think one could look at how to make such inquiries more independent and transparent um, as well. So I think these analogies are, are, are helpful. That's great, thanks so much. Um, we're getting close to the end of our uh, session. So I wanna perhaps combine a couple of questions. Um, Eben Ide uh, from the Danish National Defense College asks to both of you about your thoughts on Professor Rebecca Krutoff's uh, suggestion about introducing the concept of war torts uh, to ensure victims of, of the harms caused by the use of uh, AI-enabled systems are properly compensated. Um, and, you know, Professor Dickinson, you alluded to this in your remarks and you indicated that, yes, perhaps that could be a useful avenue, but for the fact, uh, at least as I understood what you were saying, correct me uh, if, if any of that is wrong, but, uh, but for the fact that uh, those venues to pursue those claims currently are lacking. Uh, or, or at least as a practical matter, are quite limited uh, in terms of accessibility. And that sort of leads me to a question that I want to put to both of you, which is, you know, both specifically on this question of, of torts uh, as a means of accountability, but more generally, the idea of whether there may be new institutional mechanisms you know, be, beyond some of the innovations to administrative uh, systems that Professor Dickinson has outlined, are there international institutions that need to be established here to, to uh, or, or new uh, mechanisms either domestically or multilaterally uh, that we ought to be thinking about in this context to help sort of uh, uh, resolve some of the tensions that you've identified or is it simply a matter of uh, better utilizing, uh, updating, and uh, uh, you know, ensuring access to institutions and mechanisms that already exist? Uh, do you have thoughts on either of those questions? Uh, well, I'll just say really quickly. I, I mean, I think tort law is is interesting because, of course, it's designed around um, 
uh, dealing with, in many cases, uh, non-intentional or negligent harms, and, and even in some cases, uh, strict liability situations. Um, it, and I think Professor Krutoff's recommendation is interesting. I, I do, as you said, think that the, one of the big challenges on the international level is the lack of venues. Um, on the domestic level in the United States, we have significant immunities that we've placed uh, for a variety of good reasons. Some would say those immunities should be um, reduced, but we have immunities on, on tort, uh, tort claims uh, involving military action. So I, I think it's not uh, super practical in the near or medium term. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's a little bit more practical to focus on existing mechanisms, but at the same time, I think it's worth thinking about uh, the, the horizon, the, the distant future. Um, as others have pointed out, uh, creating new systems is time consuming and hard, uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't necessarily uh, think about it. But I think in the near and medium term, it's more effective to focus on the existing institutions that we have. Great. Uh, uh, Professor Lee, you get the last word here before we conclude. Uh, I would like to, to uh, clarify the, uh, my point, and uh, I, I did mean um, there is uh, uh, actually in uh, at the domestic level there are really many uh, uh, forms of uh, responsibility we can uh, invoke to to hold some somebody to to, uh, to be accountable. But uh, if we look at the international level, uh, actually uh, we we only have the uh, two options, the re state responsibility and uh, criminal responsibility. But uh, even if we talk about the, the compensation, uh, the war tort, uh, we have to uh, establish the state responsibility before that. And then we talk about the compensation. That's my point. Great. I think that's a terrific uh, point to end on. And I think it's wonderful that we're having these conversations. I hope that uh, this is uh, just a starting point. Um, it's certainly, uh, you know, not, not, our, not the finish line, but uh, it's wonderful uh, to connect on these questions. And hopefully this can uh, stimulate some further uh, constructive uh, thinking and collaboration going forward. So I thank both of you for approaching the conversation in that spirit and for your very uh, insightful points raised throughout the hour. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Cherry, back to you. Thank you very much, Robert, and thank you to, to Laura and Li Chung for your presentations. And and uh, Li Chung, you had to get up in the three o'clock hour uh, to do this, which is very United States Marine Corps of you. We're very proud of you, and, and thank you. Um, but thank you to all three of thank you, you so for much. your participation. <laughs> Um, okay. And uh, we will turn to the future uh, in our next panel in 10 minutes. So we'll see everybody back here at uh, 4 o'clock or 16, uh, I'm sorry, 4.10 or 1610. Thank you very much. Oh, welcome back for our last session of the day. Uh, thank you all for joining us and hanging in there so far. Um, I will say that if we were located in Newport, uh, this panel, which is co-sponsored by the Libra Institute at the United States Military Academy at West Point, would be standing between you and a lovely evening in Newport. Uh, but since this is on Zoom, uh, and also it's going to be like 26 degrees tonight here, um, so um, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, our moderator for Futures Command and Technology on the Battlefield is Sasha Radin, and Sasha is a Director of Research and Publications for the Libra Institute, and I turn it over to you, Sasha. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lieutenant Colonel Cherry, and thanks also to Major Tinkler and Professor Kraska and the whole Stockton Center team for organizing this. It's great. Um, and hi, everybody who's watching. I hope you're still staying with us in this last panel of the day. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce the panel on Futures Command and Technology on the Battlefield with Colonel Stephanie Ahern and Professor Chris Jenks. And I'm especially excited about this panel because it marks the beginning of Libra's partnership with Army Futures Command. And so I want to take just a few minutes before introducing the panel itself to talk about this partnership. For those of you who don't know, the Lieber Institute for Law and Land Warfare is situated at West Point in the Law Department. It's an American-centric think tank, and we look at the law of armed conflict. That's our thing uh, in some related areas as well. 
And we were founded a few years ago in 2016 with the intention of bringing together military expertise and academic expertise on the study of the law of armed conflict. Because we feel really strongly that in order for the law to keep its relevance as we move forward into future battles, future conflicts, we have to have the practitioners in the room. And we also have to have those academics with deep expertise and time to think about these things in the room as well. And so we see ourselves as a bridge between these communities and also others, uh, as we'll talk about, in order to have a place for them to come and discuss their approaches and inform each other on their approaches. And this is one of the reasons why we're so excited to work with Army Futures Command, because we feel this is exactly what we'll be doing with with Futures Command, as, as, your, as Futures Command is thinking through what warfare will look like, what the Army will need in 2035 and beyond, and I'll leave that to Colonel Ahern to talk more about, but as, as they're doing that, we at the Lieber Institute will be helping think through the legal implications with our internal experts, our senior fellows and board members, and our wider network of experts. And we are especially, we think, and as has been mentioned throughout the day today, we especially think it's important that these issues are thought about in the early stages at the onset. Um, it's really important to integrate the law as well as other things into the planning, discussions, etc. And so today we're thrilled to have two of the people who will be heavily involved in this effort here with us. So we have Colonel Stephanie Ahern, who is Director of Concepts at Future and Concepts Center at Army Futures Command, a bit of a mouthful, <laughs> hope I got it right. And <laughs> Professor Chris Jenks, who's an Associate Professor at the Dedman School of Law at SMU. And important for our purposes here, he's also one of Lieber's Senior Fellows who will be heavily involved in this effort. And they both have long bios, a lot of expertise in their field. I encourage you to look online um, at the events page website for their full bios. But for now, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll turn it over um, to the panelists where this panel will, as the title says, focus on futures, Army Futures Command. So it'll be a bit different from earlier panels today. And Colonel Ahern will first give an overview of what Army Futures Command does what it is, a brief overview, and then she'll turn to what we might, some of the things we might expect in future warfare. And after that, Professor Jenks will raise some legal issues or perhaps legal questions we should be thinking about. And then we'll have time for audience questions. And we really encourage you to submit your questions throughout. You have two really great experts here and it's such an opportunity to uh, ask things of them. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Colonel Ahern. Thank you. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, so I just, I, first of all, I wanna thank you so much, Sasha and Professor Jenks. It's such an honor to be able to, to share this, this discussion with you virtually. Um, it really is a critical partnership for us at the Futures and Concepts Center and Army Futures Command to be a part of this partnership with the Lieber Institute as well. So just very quickly, starting about Army Futures Command and then the task that General Murray, the commanding general of Army Futures Command has given those within my organization. Um, so very quickly on Army Futures Command, it is the first four-star level command that the Army has stood up since 1973. It was established in 2018 in Austin, Texas. So that's where I'm currently at now. Um, there are four main missions that it's really looking abroad of like, how do we consolidate all efforts within the modernization efforts for the army together, looking at how we fight, what we fight with and who we are. And so the four main missions that the tasks that, that AFC has, the first is describing the future operational environment. So we have a threat section, a threat organization, uh, Mr. Bornston, that looks at uh, what are the defense and other trends from an intelligence perspective that we need to be designing the future to be able to address. Um, the second core focus is to develop and deliver future concepts. 
Um, so as we're thinking about the ideas of how the Army could operate in the future, from the operational level to, to smaller, um, how could, how should the Army be operating in this future environment? The third main effort that Army Futures Command has is to develop and deliver future force designs. So we don't just stay at that broad level of the ideas. Once we get the concept, then we do experimentation, modeling and simulations, war game analysis to be able to refine it to a much more precise level so that when we pass it off to other parts of the Army, that they know specifically what, what we need that future force to be able to do. And then finally, to support the delivery of modernization solutions. So part of the reason why Army Futures Commands exist is to make sure that when we have an idea about something that the warfighter needs, how do we much more quickly get it from that idea to an actual solution in the warfighter's hands? And so making sure from that modernization, from the acquisition side, that we are really helping streamline and bring those parts together. Um, so it's much more than just the tech material, but that material aspect is absolutely critical in what we do. And so I'm the director of concepts, we call it DOC, so D-O-C. And what General Murray has asked my team to do, working with many different parts of the Army Futures Command, is to develop the Army's next operational concept for 2035 and describing if we were to have a battle with a, a, a near-peer adversary in 2035, how could we operate or fight? How could we be equipped? And how could we be organized? And so we still firmly believe that war is going to be a clash of wills and that if countries decide to, to fight, uh, that there it's death and destruction is probably likely. Um, how could we in that, uh, that high intensity conflict to be able to prosecute things in a way to be able to win on the battlefield. Um, but even though the, the nature of, of warfare is, is most likely going to stay constant, uh, it's still governed by rules. And it's not that Hobbesian uh, uh, chaos. And that's why from the law of armed conflict, whether it's you know 100 years today or in the future, those, those rules about how we're prosecuting warfare absolutely really matter to us. Um, so our G2, the intelligence part of the Army Futures Command, recently developed a future operational environment, 2035 to 50. Um, many of the things of, of those of you that have any political science background, um, you know, that unipolar moment is probably gone. And so what this document describes as alternative futures mm -hmm. of what could be, so very similar of the global trends, 2035, the joint operational environment, 2040, um, and it helps explain as we progress into the future, how it changes in the international power, um, but then also from a technology perspective, and I think really from this discussion today, is how could potential revolutionary technologies change what that warfare, the future battlefield could be. And so from the responsibility that we have in DOC is, is really based off of that future operational environment that we have, that we expect, um, what does that mean for those of us that are focused on the land power? and how the army could fight what we could fight with and how we could organize. And one, again, one of the, the main efforts that we within the Army Futures Command are, are approaching this is we call it a Team Ignite approach, but it's really from the very beginning, how do we get those of us that do concepts, working with the science and technology experts, working with the threat experts, and thankfully with this partnership also bringing in um, from the legal perspective, the think tanks, the academia, how do we get as many of those ideas from the front so that we're not writing science fiction um, and that the scientists they are able to see what could be are able to bring together some of these solutions from the beginning. And so we just, we really appreciate being able to be a part of this discussion um, as far as just as we take on this, this concept right now. Sorry, Sasha, I can't hear you. Sorry, uh, thanks a lot. And now maybe you uh, you can talk about some of the things we might expect, even though we don't know what will be. But yep, absolutely. Um, and so, so thank you. There is much that we don't know about the future warfare. Um, there's maybe six things, and this isn't you know they're they're not in any order, but some of the the. Uh, based off the experimentation that we've done and based off of the outreach with s &T, with think tanks, with academia that, that we are expecting. So the first being the ubiquitous sensors. 
So we do not expect to have ubiquitous information or ubiquitous understanding, but you know, the, the phone that I'm talking on right now is itself a sensor. It can see, it can tell you where you're at in the world. Uh, some of them to be able to see how fast is the wind, are there uh, you know, electromagnetic signals going through. So a sensor being able to, to understand, to give you some kind of information. We're not gonna have perfect awareness, but from the military perspective, our ability to hide and our ability to surprise is, is critical to many of the things we're going to do. And so this is going to be for us and also those adversaries, what does that mean for the, for the future? Um, the second is the increasing role of information. And so information, part of that is the digits, the data that's moving across the battlefield, but it's also the role of ideas and the disinformation, the misinformation, the social media, the deep fakes. Um, I think Peter Singer and his uh, book on like war is showing not only what's able to be done from an information warfare perspective, but when you actually are having warfare on the battlefield, how that role of information is really complicating things. We don't think it's going to get easier. The third, as far as as we have these, these sensors and the role of the information is that our weapons and equipment are going to need to have greater what we call range or the ability, the distance um, to be able to go faster, to have greater awareness um, and to have better lethality. Um, and in most cases, precision. Um, we're going to be on a battlefield where in the counterinsurgency and the counterterrorism, we're often operating within and among the people. If we're going to be facing a, a great power adversary, that may not necessarily be the case. Um, and so how do we make sure that our systems are designed for, for the threats that we'll be facing? The fourth is that in addition to the technologies that we have and are developing today, the role of new disruptive technology. So uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, autonomy and robotics. We fundamentally believe that, especially if those are able to work together, they could change what's possible on the, the modern battlefield. And so we need to make sure that we are understanding where the science is, where the technology could be sooner, and, and being able to use those when and where it makes sense. And then in the fifth uh, section is, is that if it's dull, dangerous, or dirty, um, we should be using machines when possible. And so much of that work by 2035 is really gonna be in that dull category. So what is your administrative, your training, your logistics? If we could just do predictive maintenance using AI, um, if from a training perspective, you have a soldier that shows up at basic training and for the rest of their time, they're able to have that training go with them. There's a lot of really kind of fundamental, uninteresting things that, that AI would be able to help with. Um, but when you look also from the dangerous perspective, a first principle is that first contact with an adversary should probably be with a non-human. And what does that mean? Um, I think the other thing though is, is that as we're trying to figure out the AI autonomy and robotics, it's not just what humans are able to do right now. So if any of you have been watching uh, Star Wars or The Mandalorian, where you have vehicles that are able to hover off a cliff and not crash, how could that possibly change how we're able to operate? And we're, you know, we're trying to make sure, again, this isn't something that's science fiction, but where, where could technology be in 2035? And then the last thing, um, and then I uh, appreciate questions and feedback, um, is that it's the scru increased scrutiny on what humans must do. And so we, uh, in America, we, we fiercely believe that humans absolutely must be uh, on the loop to be able to, uh, when we're prosecuting lethal force. Um, in addition to having an accountability, we also firmly believe that human and machine teaming um, benefits from soldiers' creativity. They are able to understand the context. They're able to adapt to the unexpected. And frankly, they're unpredictable. And when you're trying to face an adversary, that's something that actually is a benefit to us. Um, however, there are things as far as swarms and missile garages when you're on a protection side. Um, and I think in, in previous discussions with Professor Jenks, our Patriot systems, when you're having incoming missiles, some of those things may need to be able to have you know, automatic use of, of autonomy. Um, but just like we have phones that are protecting us against spam and car pistons that are firing, we need to be deliberate. We need to think about this upfront. What makes sense to make sure that humans are helping inform these decisions? Um, and so I just wanted to finish with the uh, 2035 is not going to bring Terminator. Um, there's also real risk for any country that's wanting to defer these decisions to machines 
and really the, the role of, of LOAC, the role of Lieber Institute, to make sure that we're thinking through what are these legal implications for those large-scale conflicts that could happen in the future and something that we haven't seen for probably 30 years. You know, what are the laws that we need to develop versus reach symbols versus we actually just need to clarify law versus policy? Um, we are so appreciative of this partnership to be able to make sure that we're thinking from the very beginning about what those, those implications are. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Jenks, over to you. Thanks, Sasha. Uh, and thank you, uh, Colonel Ahern, and also thanks to Major Tinkler, Lieutenant Colonel Cherry, and the entire Stockton Center for organizing this event and including a panel on the Army's Future Command. Though, to be fair, it's perhaps fitting, as in the very near future, Army will commandingly dominate Navy uh, in football. So I appreciate that, Lieutenant Colonel Cherry. Um, I want to briefly highlight some law of armed conflict, either issues or questions based on Colonel Ahern's remarks. But before doing so, I want to clarify the framework that I believe Army Futures Command is operating under and by which those legal issues arise. As Paul Shar mentioned in the opening keynote, the terms artificial intelligence or AI and autonomy are subject to varied understandings. I certainly am not venturing into those definitional black holes, but just want to suggest that perhaps a more helpful way to think of them is as technological descriptors. And as we just heard from Colonel Ahern, the Army's technology transformation is an evolving process. And that serves as a reminder that we shouldn't think of technology in either static or binary terms that a system or a machine is either AI or autonomous, or it's not. Rather, I think the Defense Science Board's explanation of technology is reflecting a, quote, capability of the larger system enabled by the integration of human and machine abilities is more useful. And that entails assessing what humans and machines are capable of doing, along with preferences as to which entity performs which tasks. And I think that's reflected in what Colonel Hearn just mentioned about dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks being performed by machines when possible, while preserving a role for human judgment in the application of force. Now, a lot of attention is paid to technology and the use of force, but much, even a majority of the applications, as we just learned, really are going to be in administrative training and logistics functions. But those non-use of force applications are still subject to the law of armed conflict in several ways. But I just want to focus on one, the constant care obligation from Article 57 of Additional Protocol 1 to the 1949 Geneva Conventions. The constant care obligation refers to the requirement that, quote, in the conduct of military operations, constant care shall be taken to spare the civilian population, civilians, and civilian objects. Particularly in the area, excuse me, particularly in the area of driverless vehicles, whether ground or air, it will be interesting to see how understandings of the constant care obligation evolve. Earlier today, we heard speakers discussing how the law of armed conflict does not prohibit the use of autonomy. Within the next 10 to 20 years, which is the time horizon for most vehicles in the US anyway, to be driverless, Will driverless technology become so ubiquitous that the constant care obligation will require first world countries to use driverless vehicles in and around the battlefield? Now, in terms of the use of force, I think it's important to remember that the law of war imposes obligation on, obligations on persons and not weapons. Machines, computers lack agency, don't have legal personality, and cannot assume legal obligations. I also wanna stress the danger of conflating weapons, which may be per se illegal versus the unlawful use of weapons. We've heard about some technological challenges involving machines perceiving context. Maybe the technology will overcome those challenges and maybe it will not. But even where there are challenges or limitations, say on the ability to distinguish between military objectives and civilian objects, that doesn't mean the weapon is per se illegal. Rather, where and how that system is used would need to be considered. And I would just commend uh, Mike Schmidt and Jeff Thurner's 
uh, Harvard National Security Law Journal on Out of the Loop uh, for anyone who's interested in more on that discussion. As a result, what I think that what we should expect here in the U.S. is the development of AI-enabled systems inversely proportional to the possibility of an untoward event involving civilians. That means the Navy developing subsurface systems and the Air Force high altitude systems before the Army develops anything other than defensive systems. Colonel Ahern, in our discussions leading up to today's event, you were quite clear that neither your office, Future Concepts, nor Army Futures Command are the proverbial good idea fairy, you know, utterly divorced from reality. And you stress the, the feasibility that if feasibility is an important uh, criteria. And to that end, you have resisted my attempts at promoting turning the 60 ton M1 Abrams tank into a hover tank. But I wanna, I wanna end by just noting that an earlier panel suggested that the role of at least some lawyers may need to shift to be more front loaded, either in the acquisition, fielding or use of weapons and systems. So given the need for future concepts to be feasible, are you, will you and Futures Command be considering where and when DOD lawyers, civilian and military play a role? And I'll turn it back over to Sasha or Colonel Ahern. Sasha, do you want me to answer that? Yeah, go ahead, Colonel Ahern. And so, uh, so I think uh, the reason why General Murray was so supportive of having Army Futures Command be partnered with the Lieber Institute was when he went and visited West Point, this opportunity came up and he seized on it. And so I think this is, as we've, uh, from the, the Director of Concepts started to work on this con the, what the future concept should be, some of our initial deep dives have been with lawyers and ethicists. But I think this formalized partnership that we have with Weber Institute is, is completely indicative of why um, the previous approaches that we've had, whether it was you know the, the rigidly um, sequential of let's come up with an idea and then eventually we'll walk through the widgets. Uh, we can't afford to do that. And so having this partnership with the, the legal community and the law of armed conflict, those that are actually presented that use this, it's it's the core of, of who we are as Americans and what's expected of us. Thank you. And that, that opens up our time for questions and it relates uh, to a question posed by Professor Jensen. And uh, Professor Jensen, if you, I don't know if that answered your full question, but he had asked, how do you incorporate legal advice in your work? And do you think there's sufficient legal input into your command to ensure that weapons development complies with the law of armed conflict? Um, so I, I think that relates to what um, Professor Jenks just asked you. I don't know, Colonel Aaron, if you want to add anything to it. Well, absolutely. Uh, su sufficient. Uh, um, Colonel Jose Cora is the staff judge advocate for General Murray and is one of General Murray's key interested agents. Um, but I think we are trying to make sure that it's not just those of us that are within Army Futures Command. Um, how do we make sure that as we're thinking across these systems and they're thinking across in time, we really are, I've been in a job only a couple of months and, and so thankful that we're getting this at the front end of our efforts. So um, I, I would say that we are welcoming the partnerships and, uh, and are eager to make sure that this is not just something that we come back a year from now and, and remember this, this good discussion that we had and wonder what happened in the meantime. Thank you. Um, we've focused a lot today on other panels and here on autonomy, robotics, and AI, um, but you're at Futures, that's not all you're doing, as you said earlier. And so we have a question here that says, um, to what extent do you think biotechnology could play a role in future warfare? Over. Um, I, I think that it's in the, both in the, the very productive, how are we making sure that our soldiers are more resilient, that if something happens to them, that they can recover much more quickly, that we're maintaining their health. Um, but I think what, what we're seeing today and that we've gone through for the past nine months, we're also showing the tremendous implications of what uh, biological threats can have. And so 
So uh, it's it's not just you know, the, the great powers that are paying attention to this. And so there is a, a lot of work that's, that's being done across the Army Futures Command, but also working very closely with, with academic and, and, uh, and some of our lab partners to make sure that, that we better understand what are those threats. Uh, but then also what are the opportunities for, for the resilience and the maximizing the human performance? Again, in an American way, but you know, if we can make our soldiers able to do better, to be healthier, to be more resilient, that's, that is a goodness that we're trying to explore as well. Thank you. And on that idea of what others, um, what others might be doing, one of the questions that um, and Professor Sassoli is asking is, do you also think about how the enemy, both state and non-state actors will develop? And that just, I think he means it generally, not just in biotechnology. No, thank you. And I, I this was one of the things that when we were scrutinizing what humans must do, um, that I, I forgot to mention is to say, even though that we are bound by law of armed conflict and the principles that were codified in some of our founding documents, we are fully aware that some of our adversaries are not. And that doesn't mean that we're going to follow their example. Um, for instance, just because others steal intellectual property doesn't mean that we should. Um, however, in order to make sure that we are much more resilient for how others uh, might be operating in this space, um, we one is we appreciate any of the support and understanding coming from the legal community about what that could mean. Um, but this is something that from a concepts perspective, we're also trying to make sure that we can be, make ourselves more resilient against uh, those that may not apply the same standards that, that we're willing to prosecute. Thanks. And we have another question that says the problem with a legal analysis of any problem is the lawyer is effectively constrained by the facts presented and the intended use. How do you work with your legal team to get a legal opinion on these future weapons? And are you actually embedding them like Jags in the war games and then asking for an opinion, similar to the previous questions. <laughs> I think this is part of why uh, um, Colonel Cora is, is part of General Murray's immediate staff and that's replicated throughout the, the different parts of the organization, is that you can't wait till you have the solution and then say, what do you think? It is then that's, that's not making them part of the solution and making sure that you know, the letter and the spirit is brought in from the beginning. Um, but again, I think that there are some opportunities that we have in part because we've been focused on counterinsurgency and counterterrorism for 19 years. So we've grown entire generations of officers that are used to focusing on a different problem set. And so making sure that we understand you know, where, where is the law and as we're thinking through some of these new problems that technology is posing, that we're also bringing in experts that can help work through these problems from the legal side as well. Professor Jenkins, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, the thank you. The uh, Going back to how the U.S. has fought over the last, really now, 20 years, there have been a number of, I mean, in fighting largely non-state actors and in counterinsurgency, insurgency, there have been a number of uh, policy choices that have been made uh, regarding civilian casualties. Um, I also think that we, because of the nature of the warfare we've engaged in over the last 20 years, I think there's been some forgetfulness about uh, the idea of sensor-based targeting as, you know, as a very real thing that a lot of uh, former military will identify with, you know, growing up on the idea that you would target, you would target based on a radar radar emission. So I think um, I, I think there is some re-education both of, of the military and maybe even also uh, the public, whether it's just because of the nature of the warfare of the last 20 years or of some of the policy choices, uh, the policy choices uh, that were made that while perhaps appropriate for a counterinsurgency may not be as appropriate or as applicable uh, in a high intensity uh, conflict with a near peer adversary. We have a question from a panelist from a panel earlier this afternoon, and forgive me, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Eben Ida. Uh, she has, she's directing this to both of you. Uh, what are your thoughts on how to handle distributed decision-making in future conflicts in order to ensure that the appropriate type and level of human machines are made? Are you considering new command control concepts 
and the need for more clear dis description of roles and responsibilities. Uh, I don't know who wants to take that first. I'm happy to jump in. Um, so yes, yeah, the, the answer is absolutely. Um, part of the challenge with having the ability to have sensors in so many places, and you look at specifically how the Russians have been prosecuting their warfare for a while, is that when you have large formations together, um, they are able to actually quickly annihilate them and they don't care what's in the way. Um, and so one of the things as we're, we're looking for the future of how we could fight we're not leading with the command and control, the how the organization, but you know, how could we operate the equipment that we would need and then the organization to be able to, to not only be able to maneuver, um, but to be able to have that command and control. So we, we aren't starting with the questions on how we're going to command and control across the battlefield, but that will be quickly part of, of this, uh, this future concept that we're looking at. No, and I think that's a that's an interesting question, and we've been so focused on uh, technology and the select and engage uh, aspects of the use of force. But at some point, and I think this goes back to Colonel Ahern's remarks at the outset, you know, wanting to understand where technology is making decisions uh, based on sensor inputs uh, that get into or that cross the line into what we think of as a command and control. So where, where is it that we're comfortable with command and control or command and control-like decisions uh, or assessments being made by machines or algorithms versus where do we need or want to preserve uh, the role of the, you know, of the human? Yeah, that makes me think of uh, the program you had a few weeks ago, Colonel Ahern. Somebody said, what if, a, what if a commander has command but not control, what that might mean? Um, we have another question that is directed to you, Colonel Ahern. Has Army Futures Command begun thinking about the role of the tactical commander within, the fu within the fu this future operational concept? And what are the skills and traits that you would want from future company commanders? For example, will he or she be expected to have more technical expertise these technical technologies, as these technologies develop um, yeah, the, this uh, Rob, he says he's sure you're thinking about what will be asked of future Army captains and NCO leaders, as well as the responsibilities they'll have. So, uh, so two-part answer on that. So one, that we're starting at the operational level, and so how would we prosecute that war? Um, and so the much more of the, the thorough analysis will be done later. Um, but that said, the Army Futures Command, uh, in direct support of what General McConville's priority of people and the Secretary's priority on people, is that we, we know now that we need to have leaders who are able to, to be agile and responsive and ethical, but also have a better appreciation of the technology that they're working. And so there are initiatives that Army Futures Command has already launched so some of in a partnership with Carnegie Mellon University to make sure that we are developing leaders that have technical, the, the data experts that we will need. In addition, there's another initiative that will start right at the beginning of the year called the Software Factory. And so helping more people across the Army just become more familiar, more comfortable with data, data management, data engineering, um, so that we aren't having to rely on people outside of the Army to be able to, to move forward. But uh, yes, and much more to come. Thanks. Uh, we have a comment here by Pete Pedrozo. There have been a number of tests that have pitted man versus machine, and in every case, the machine wins. If the US continues to assist, insist that there be a person in or on the loop, but an adversary does not, won't that place us at a significant disadvantage on the battlefield, like bringing a, a knife to a gunfight? over. I think that's, well, I don't know if either of you have a comment on that. I, I would say that uh, to go is probably one of the, the examples that you know, comes up. And the machine didn't win every time. Um, and in fact, when you pair machines with human machine teaming, usually the human 
team, the human machine teaming will win. And so I think part of this is understanding, um, you know, when you had the, um, the Go project, is part of it was how did they define success, right? And if they won by one, they still won. Um, and so I think the one of just, uh, of who we are as Americans, but we actually think that, you know, being very deliberate upfront about what are those things that humans are just naturally better at. Um, and uh, I don't think the evidence has yet said that, uh, that having uh, machines always beat humans. Um, so I, I, we're definitely not pursuing just that path because it's better. And Sasha, you know, on that, and I guess I should clarify that I'm speaking in my individual capacity and my comments don't reflect either Army's Futures Command, uh, the Libra Institute or, or the Army. Uh, I mean, as to Pete's question, uh, I think that one of the reasons why the U.S. has been steadfast in resisting this push to adopt the term control uh, in terms of the role of the human on the application of uh, use of force. So the AI principles use the, the term governable, um, and we talk in the United Nations context about exercising, you know, exercising judgment in the application of force. I think that is an implicit recognition that machines, as you said, are performing in many ways, in ways that we, we, we were kidding ourselves if we think of or use the term control, just look at what the Patriot system is doing uh, at, at any given time. So we need to have humans with a role such that they can turn off, basically, reboot a system if there's untoward, uh, untoward events. But I think the U.S. has been, U.S. and a number of countries have been wise to resist the push towards uh, accepting the terminology of control uh, and rather using the term uh, judgment. And Sasha, one more thing on that. So, the, so Colonel John Boyd had come up with the OODA loop. So observe, orient, decide, act. That often within the Army, we'll talk about see, understand, decide, act. And so when you're trying to think through how are decisions made and actions done, um, being able to see and understand much more quickly is helpful to be able to take in massive amounts of information. But that decision has to also be based on context. And you can train algorithms, but you can't train them for the unexpected. And so having those ability to be able to sort through massive amounts of information coming from you know, hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of sensors, to be able to make sense of it, to make decisions, especially on lethal force, uh, is something that, that we just, we feel very committed to. Um, and that you know, there are tremendous implications if you're just allowing a machine to try to sort through uh, what information that it's, it's not taking into context. Colonel Ahern, if I, if I could, um, I think you, know, you and I talked about this before. You know, I started off as an infantry officer at Fort Benning. They talked about you know, your span of control that the, you know, the infantry squad leader can appropriately, adequately supervise you know, X number, five, six, seven, uh, soldiers, and you can say that they've got more than that, but realistically, they're not effectively supervising or managing those. And I just wonder, with all these sensors and all of this great input that we're currently going to have given to warfighters down at a very low level, is there any concern or is that anything that Futures Command is looking at is, you know, sensor overload in terms of how much is an infantry squad leader able to process at any given time in terms of multitasking all this input? Absolutely, but it, that's not a 2020 challenge either. You know, when we went from the typeset to the typewriter to the computer, this is something that we've had to, how do you separate uh, the, the noise from, from the actual real information? So I think part of this is, is why the training aspect of this, you don't just show up one day and they issue you the AI and you go out and you fight a war. Um, part of this is developing that trust over time of what is this machine, what is this autonomous ro robot able to do? How are we able to train it and to train ourselves to be able to understand how these partner together? Um, and so th it is absolutely a concern of, of having so much information that it's just, it turns into noise. Um, but that said, you know, that being able to have a system to work through this, to be able to, if you have a, an operational approach and you can test it millions of times as opposed to in five war games, right. you'll have a better understanding of what's in the realm of possible, but 
but it's it is absolutely a concern because at the end of the day you know, that human we are still limited on what we're able to to understand and to the context we're putting it in thanks and we have a question from colonel reeves actually a two-part question to both of you so first, could you please discuss how you see the prolif proliferation of groups like the Russians Wag like the Russian Wagner group, how they may impact future combat operations? And also, could Professor Jenks discuss the existing law and whether it is adequate to address this growing threat? I don't know who wants to take that first. Jenks, do you want to go first on that? I mean, just in terms of, uh, Jane, I'm not sure if your comment, it just non either the, the mercenary aspect or the private security, private security contractor aspect of the, uh, the Wagner group. Uh, I mean, that's obviously not a, not a new phenomenon. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think, and as we've seen, you know, non-state actors, terrorist groups are all increasingly using uh, increasingly using technology that we, we may have thought was reserved uh, for the state. So uh, I don't see a particularly unique challenge vis-a-vis uh, -vis the fact that countries are private actors or state-sponsored, large, somewhat state-sponsored uh, private actors, seemingly private actors are operating in the battle space of another country. I mean, I think that gets into almost even a, a you said bellum uh, and an inter international legal wrongs kind of uh, doctrine more than a specific LOAC doctrine, unless you uh, want to get into the discussion about mercenaries. And I would add as far as um, the future operational environment, the document that we had that's focused on the 2035 to 2050. Um, statistically speaking, you, uh, it is rare to have large scale conflict. And in fact, one of the efforts that we want to do is we want to deter great powers uh, from starting a large-scale conflict because of the, the immense suffering that goes along with it. Um, but that doesn't mean that conflict is going to end. And so having some of these proxies um, to see what others, what, to see what they're able to get away with uh, is probably not going away. And so what's the role of information and what's the role of being able to get to places quickly what's the role of being able to strengthen our allies and partners so that when they have these challenges one we can very quickly understand what's happening but how can we reinforce them to make them more capable to to also uh, be able to ha handle some of these challenges that are most likely going to get worse if not better thanks we have a another question uh from Mr. Eric Rischel from Army Futures Command. It's to both of you. He says, with the preliminary news regarding China's development of quantum computing, do either of you have thoughts on how that quantum leap in computing power will affect cyber warfare information and similar systems? I know we have some others, frankly, that are participating or in the audience that I know are much more qualified. Uh, to comment on, on that than I am. The, the main thing that I would say is, is that we are very thankful that we have amazing scientists and amazing technology experts within the Army Futures Command family um, that are watching this very closely and helping inform us about what could be in the future. Um, and then from the threat side that are paying attention to, to what China is doing as well. And Related to Professor Jenkins' point about sensory overload, does the future technological landscape potentially change the nature of command? Will it be possible for command and all the responsibilities and the authorities we think about going with it to reside in just one person? Or will command necessarily have to be dispersed? And Professor Jenks, what implications does this have for legal principles such as command responsibility and obedience to orders? Uh, oh, um, so that last part was not what I was expecting. Um, but I would say that um, I, there are many layers of commands. And so it's not one commander and then everybody else is, is waiting for one person to make the order. So depending on 
the type of operation, depending on the severity of, of that operation, would depend on what level that we would have. So we have many different echelons, in part because we're, we're really spread out across a, a wide area. Um, the one thing that I'd say, and then turn to Professor Jenks, is, is that the, we, at the individual level, like, you are absolutely responsible for the actions that you commit. Um, so if it's legal, ethical, and moral, then if it's a command, you should do it. If it's not, you are personally responsible. And I think, you know, we have, thankfully, uh, the law has shown that, that that's an individual obligation in addition to, uh, to what uh, we are doing at the unit level. But Professor Jenks, let me turn it over to you. Um, I mean, part of the challenge is we're, we're talking about notional, not consistent, you know, what if uh, kind of systems that may or frankly may not be developed at some point um, in the future. I would just, I would just stress that all countries have a built-in incentive to have reliable, predictive systems, systems that are designed and perform as, uh, as designed. So it's, it's always surprising to me at some of these international uh, discussions that we, we've engaged in, in in Geneva, where the premise of the the premise of the discussion is the idea that a military would have developed a system that doesn't perform reliably and does things uh, unpredictably. No, no military in in the world wants that system and would pay money and develop and field uh, such a system. So, I mean, I think part of the challenge and the issues we're just going to need to wait and see the kinds of systems and the ideas that Colonel Ahern and Futures Command, the Army and the rest of the US military come up with, recognizing that I think one of the strengths of the law of armed conflict and one of the reasons why it's still as relevant and applicable today in 2020 is that it's predicated, the answer to, almost, to, the answer to so many law of armed conflict questions is contextual reasonableness. Uh, so I think in the end, that will be the answer to a lot of questions in terms of uh, compliance or uh, functionality under the law of armed conflict with some of these future systems. We're almost out of time and there's still a number of really interesting questions. I think given the time, I'll just end it with one that might be a quick one for a quick answer maybe for both of you. Uh, Char Charlie Dunlap says, is there any prospect that AI and machine learning could somehow supplement or even replace the human legal advisor? Could we have an AI JAG? Uh, I don't. I, I don't see that. I think the challenge. You know, we had Mike Meyer uh, was moderating a panel earlier. I think a more near-term issue is how do you operationally test an AI-enabled uh, weapon system? A system, and it's one thing if you've got a, a new rifle round, a new artillery round, you can fire that however many thousand times and have an under have an idea how it's going to perform. That's really just a function of ballistics and physics. Um, but with an AI system that's designed to you know, expect the unexpected and react to, frankly, limitless uh, scenarios and environments, how you, could, how you could test such a system and whether or not simulations, uh, what role simulations might play in the, uh, in the testing. So I think that to me, the, the real issue is, is there a way where we could do legal reviews of AI-enabled uh, weapons? But that's a question I think that's some, still some ways off. I don't think any commander would be supportive of having a machine providing him or her legal advice. Um, so it, helping inform their legal advice maybe, but, but not as a substitute, no. Thanks, and I'm sorry for the other questions that we don't have time to answer. I wanna thank our panelists very much for, um, for all your input and your information. And now I'll turn it over to Kieran for his closing remarks, thanks. Thanks, Sasha, and thanks also to Colonel Ahern and Professor Jenks for giving us a glimpse into the future there uh, and how the US Army is um, looking to deal with some of the challenge that's, that's likely to pose. Uh, I'd like to thank again all the panelists and speakers today for what's been an excellent day and to all the attendees for joining us. We will reconvene at 1100 hours tomorrow morning uh, where we're fortunate to have a keynote um, presentation by um, the Deputy Attorney General for International Law at the Israeli Ministry of Justice, uh, and then to follow three um, panels on cyberspace and, and international law. 
So thanks again, and we hope you can join us tomorrow.